Please do not harass or attempt to intimidate any users featured in this video. Ponder Sprocket commentaries are intended as critiques of situations of behaviors based on the information available and are meant to demonstrate wrongdoings, contradictions, or dispel false narratives so that others may come to an informed opinion. Under no circumstances is targeted harassment appropriate or encouraged. This video makes mention of and may discuss and display artwork featuring uncomfortable themes such as domestic abuse, self-harm, mental health, toxic relationships, animal abuse, as well as allusions to predatory behavior and inappropriate depictions of fictional characters. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back, my cutie pies, to part two of me going off about how someone is wrong on the internet. Mama Sprocket would be so proud. Last time, we went over a video by the user Chimerama, which made claims about a non-binary lesbian artist known as Dolly Guts, previously known as Fay Doll and Doll Claws, currently known as Salem, but whom I will be referring to Tirza in this video, as it was their name at the time of these events. These claims included things like stealing characters from other artists, the only example for which Chimerama provided wasn't actually an example of this, although there was at least one example of this to be found elsewhere, romanticizing abuse in their artwork, which is debatable as it's a matter of interpretation and seems to be more of a coping mechanism, co-opting aspects of the work of other artists into their own, which Chimerama also did, harassing artists who take inspiration from their work, which Chimerama has technically also now done, drawing an adult character in a manner that makes them look younger or childlike, which isn't an issue, drawing inappropriate sexual artwork of a character who passes for five, which they didn't do, posting real-life self-harm pictures, which they did do, animal abuse, which still has yet to be proven, and being in an obsessive abusive relationship with a toxic person, because apparently we're blaming people for being in abusive relationships now. Yeah, if you hadn't gathered, it really wasn't a good video, it spawned a bunch of not good videos, and it kind of made a bunch of people think that a gossip forum was an appropriate and objective resource. How fun. Before we begin in full, there are four points I want people to keep in mind for the whole video. The first is that while while Kaimurama and I refer to the artist being spoken about as Dolly Guts or Tirza, they have since changed their name to Salem. So anytime you are referring to them, please just remember that this is an old name, and if you want to talk about them in the present tense, you should use the name Salem instead. Similarly, for point two, Kaimurama has rebranded to a different username, which I'm not going to mention here, in an effort to distance herself from mentally straining drama and to move on to something else. So while I refer to Kaimurama as Kaimurama, please know that she has also since changed her name. Originally, I was considering going through the video and inserting little file add-ons on top of every time I said either name, but on top of that sounding like it would get really annoying really quickly, I think it's actually better that we use the old names when talking about the situation. I figure using the older names allows the situation to be covered in full without it directly impacting either of their ability to progress, and it creates a sort of distance between the old identity and the new. Thirdly, this video was made based on past events, and so I took very little consideration of events after Kaimurama's videos, because Obviously, she can't know about stuff that happened after her video was made, so I'm not going to blame her for that. However, I do want to make note that according to Salem, they broke up with Bailey in May of 2020, after, and I apologize if I don't word this correctly, an unfortunately long stint of sexual and emotional abuse. That is Salem's story, however, and so I'm not going to dive into it. Just know that they have currently broken up and that, yeah, Bailey was a shit person. Who could have guessed? Finally, please remember that Ponder Sprocket commentaries are intended as entertaining deconstructions of situations. Whether I succeed in that regard is up to the audience, but the tone that I use for the sake of comedy within these videos should not be used as fuel to harass anyone I talk about, and for here, that's Kaimurama. She made a mistake, she knows she made a mistake, and she wants to distance herself from it and progress into future endeavors. Obviously, you guys in the comments might not immediately be aware of that, but that's sort of why I'm making note of it here. Now, yes, I agree that it would be inappropriate for her to just, you know, ditch, as we've seen other users do in the past, but I think the important thing to note here is the potential for the want to learn and improve. Kaimurama had issues looking at the situation objectively because of emotional investment, which initially I don't really want to blame her for. But it should also be noted that people did try to tell Kaimurama about these issues, and allegedly, because she wasn't in a mental space to deal with it, she ended up being dismissive of these complaints and left the audience confused because of how much context was left out of her video. So. Obviously, listening when people tell you that you screwed up big time is something that Kaimurama might have to accept she's going to have to do, regardless of her mental state. I completely understand not being in the best mental space to deal with a video, but I also don't want to downplay exactly how harmful ignoring some of these signs can be, as well as how ultimately detrimental it is to take subjective views of art and naively portray it as an objective offense against others and not as artistic expression. As well as leaving the video up for a year, because realistically, if people were telling you it was bad and the video gave you mental health issues, why would you not just take it down that 
That seems like a really obvious excuse for you to take care of your mental health. That seems to solve both problems. Whatever. I mean, realistically, if you weren't in the mental space to look over all of the facets of the situation, then by default, you shouldn't have made the second and third videos that probably didn't help the mental state at all. People make mistakes, but that shouldn't mean that they're entirely condemned for the rest of their days. I mean, that is sort of a huge point in this video, so. So far as I've been told, Kaimurama is having her friends relay the main issues of this commentary to her so that the videos don't cause her any mental strain. And if she wants to better herself, then she should have every opportunity to do so. The very same goes for Salem. Nobody's going out of their way to try and cancel anyone in this situation, which realistically, we should all be thankful for. It's just a lot of artists being kind of narrow-minded and really just co-opting the negative views of someone else about a style of artwork or a situation that they weren't involved in. We stand personal growth around these here tads, and I want to give Kaimurama and Salem both the opportunity to do so. So is that all settled? Cool. This time, we'll be diving into secondary and tertiary videos wherein Kaimurama tried to justify and explain the necessity of her first video. And because I imagine some people are looking at the video length and wondering how on earth it could be this long simply making commentary on two addendum videos, that's because we'll actually be diving into the additional context that Kaimurama video needed and explore the friend group from whom these accusations originated back in 2015. Maybe then we can get an idea of where all of this started. Let's begin. Back in October, I made a video about tea, also known as Delegates or Tirza. I wanted to make another video to respond to some of the comments left there and clear up some things I said because I am aware that during the making of that video, I was very emotional and not in the right mindset to address the issues that tea has. Thank you for admitting that your first video was flawed as a result of your emotional state, something that you, incidentally, would not have had an issue with had you removed this video like you said you were going to. You know, back when you were originally notified of this. And thank you for admitting in the description that the original video was poorly made. Really, it just makes my job of demonstrating why it should have been removed last year that much easier. It's been a while since I've uploaded, and even more so since that video came out, and I can say now that it's easier for me to talk about it. It's easier for me to make a video responding to comments that all have the same questions and undertones than responding to them all individually, so that's why I'm choosing to bring up the topic again. Although I hope this is the last time I'll be talking about them on my channel, I did want to make that video to bring awareness to their actions and behavior, but I didn't want that to be what my entire channel covered, so this will be the last time I'm bringing it up. But before I actually get into those comments and questions, I want to just clarify, I do not hate T. You might not hate them, but you're really heckin' petty. As much as they upset me with what they've said and done and continue to do, I don't hate them. In fact, I have some hope that maybe someday they can turn around and own up to everything they've done. If they apologized, I would forgive them. Yes, I'd still be cautious with them still, but I believe everyone deserves a second chance, and if there's a possibility that they can change and become a better person and realize that what they've done was wrong, I don't want to hinder that. I want to be able to see people grow and change to be better, and they are no exception. Frankly, that just makes the fact that some of the allegations are five years old, leaving the possibility that T had changed since then a lot more of a nuisance. A lot of the comments were worded in a very harmful manner, so I'm choosing not to bring those specific comments into the fray. The only ones I'll be focusing on are the ones made in genuine curiosity or criticism. One of my close friends volunteered to read the comment section and pick and choose which questions were asked most frequently. I was going to do it myself, but reading some of those comments made me feel extremely sick and I just couldn't, so I'm very grateful that my friend volunteered to search for the questions instead. What self-harm scars on characters break the barrier of acceptable? Self-harm scars on characters aren't a bad thing. They can tell stories and give background to what the character has gone through. The only time these types of scars become an issue is when you start to romanticize them. I said in my last video that showing off your scars tend to come off that way, but I was wrong. I'm admitting that. Showing off scars on a character or even on yourself isn't romanticizing the scars themselves. So one of your biggest complaints against T from the original video is now moot because here you acknowledge that, no duh, the depiction of self-harm in artwork is not inherently romanticization. That being said, wouldn't this also negate your point about the romanticization of abuse? Just because T is drawing signs of abuse doesn't inherently mean that it's being glorified. If the criteria is a direct visual depiction isn't necessarily romanticization, then shouldn't T be even more in the clear considering they don't draw any actual physical abuse. At the very least, normally I would be able to say that I could applaud you for accepting that you were wrong, except I can't because I'm very aware you were already told this months prior. Which may explain this sneaking suspicion I have that despite acknowledging this fault, T is still gonna be in the wrong somehow. 
What T does or did was draw their characters in self-harming or in gory positions where they associate it with love or obsession. I'll show some examples on screen, but please be warned they are graphic and could be potentially sensitive. But yeah, just um, don't do this shit. Unfreaking believable! So gore is just flat out not allowed, huh? Oh no, it's gore in the context of lover obsession, right? I'm guessing so long as we ignore the problems, like how this piece, titled Pentababy, is generally akin to Tears' work as a whole and is a showcase not of scars but of bruises, potentially inflicted by somebody else. Not only that, it doesn't showcase lover obsession at all. It demonstrates someone with injuries asking if they are still loved, and there are many interpretations that could go into this. Nothing about this piece inherently tells the audience that this character was injured by their obsessive lover. This piece, which I was unable to find the original for, doesn't show any harm being inflicted at all, instead showcasing Bailey licking Ash's wounds. And had someone been unaware of the personalities or relationships between these characters, then the nefarious context behind this interaction is completely lost, which could potentially be the point. Just as a side note, if we assume Tirza was trying to make some sort of statement about abuse, then outside of directly displaying the abuse or crafting a single image story, which I don't believe Tirza has the skills to do yet, then the characters being used, their personalities and relationships to one another, would actually be necessary to make this point. This one, titled Mm Yam, is a general gore piece and could easily be confused for an illustration inspired by vampires. By this logic, anyone who has ever drawn either fan art of characters or their own characters in gory situations or where they are being ripped apart by others must therein be committing the same offense. And again, this is a situation where one would have to understand the relationship and these characters first before any secondary meaning behind the piece could be gleaned. Francisco Goya was romanticizing cannibalism, you guys. I mean, at the very least, Goya actually visually depicted cannibalism happening rather than just showing Saturn with a full belly surrounded by blood, a swaddling blanket, and a bunch of hearty burps. And finally, this piece, titled I Love GF, isn't even a piece of Ash and Bailey. This is a picture of Tirza and the real life Bailey. So Tirza isn't allowed to draw themselves happily getting gored by their real life significant other. B, draw yourself getting gored for this video. You can fuck right off, I've drawn enough. I suppose we're also meant to flat out ignore that there's clearly enjoyment going on in this piece, specifically expressed by the victim. Much like how in the pieces already presented with Ash, the character's facial expression and what they are meant to be feeling in this scene is being ignored, despite the interpretation of these pieces up to this point otherwise having been completely visually literal. The gore is being read literally as physical abuse, but the facial expressions are being ignored to support that interpretation, despite them going against it. The toxic relationship is being read literally as romanticizing, but the facial expressions of the character being displeased with the situation is also ignored. This isn't how you analyze art. You don't get to pick and choose what elements you're going to consider and just say that doesn't count in regards to a different element that goes against your interpretation. Interpretations change wildly from person to person. Just because this is one interpretation doesn't mean that's what everyone else sees or even what the artist intended. I would also like people to make note of exactly how Tirza is drawn here. See the knees? That indicates that they're drawing themselves in the same vein as when they draw Ash in their doll form, as this is based on what are called ball-jointed dolls. This will come up again, I promise. And as I'm sure some of you may have noticed, I looked into the time frame for when these pieces were created. While I Love GF was created in 2018, meaning that it was at least tangentially close to when Kaimurama made her video, Pentababy and Mmm Yum were made in 2016 meaning by the end of 2019, these were almost four years old. On top of that, Self-harm scars on characters aren't a bad thing. They can tell stories and give background to what the character has gone through. You mean like going through an abusive relationship? Oh, self-harm scars are fine as long as they're revealing stuff about the character. But if the thing being revealed is bad, then I don't like it. Pray tell, what exactly would be an acceptable experience to get scars and injuries from? Hmm? Emotional abuse? Traumatic accidents? Depression? Assault? War? Oh, but I get ya. Physical abuse from a lover is too far. If someone paints a piece where a character demonstrates scars from self-harm, not the action itself, or shows injuries from being in an abusive relationship, again, not the action itself, well that's just ridiculous. That's going too far. At least make it self-harm as a result of psychotic depression. After all, think of the children. And to end it off, despite Kaimurama saying this, What T 
does or did was draw their characters in self-harming or in gory positions where they associate it with love or obsession. They're kind of outright lying! T doesn't draw Ash self-harming. Self-harming, by default, implies that Ash is doing it to themselves. Not only have you not provided any images to show that, in all of the artwork from T that I've had to go through for this video, that being their DeviantArt, Toy House, and Patreon before it was shut down, on top of all of the blogs and other sites I've gone over discussing these accusations showing pieces that had since been deleted, I've yet to find a single image of Ash engaging in self-harm. So, if the issues are drawing characters being abused and characters harming themselves, why can I not find any evidence of T ever having done this? There are no pictures of Ash self-harming, and this is the only instance of Bailey inflicting harm on Ash that I have ever seen. If this was a constant thing, then there should be more examples. Why is this the only one presented so far? Why is stealing characters a huge no-no? Characters can be very personal to the creator. For example, my character Kira was personal to me because she helped me figure out a lot about, about myself when I was stuck and confused about my sexuality. I also designed her in a way that appealed to my tastes and interests at the time. I put a lot of effort into her backstory and personality only for T to take her design change small things about it, and successfully sell her to someone. Wow, these additional images of Kira for reference just make this complaint look so much weaker. Also, Characters can be very personal to the creator. You mean like how T has indicated that Ash is personal to them? Oh, oh, but it's bad for Tirza to dislike when people take inspiration from that character. Beyond that, your entire argument for why character design theft is bad is characters can sometimes be personal to the artists who made them. It's expressly fueled by emotions. Even then, half of what makes a character a character, that being their backstory and personality, is what you're discussing being pivotal to them here. But T didn't take your character's backstory or personality. They didn't even take the design. They took inspiration from it. Even the design of Kira herself has changed over time. So what, if T had taken inspiration from the old design, would there not be an issue because you're no longer as emotionally attached? If it's bad for people to steal character designs because the character might have sentimental value, then theoretically, a person could take the design of a character that they were aware the artist was not emotionally attached to, since you said they can be personal. That means not always. And if that's the case, again, why does that excuse you from taking inspiration from T's artwork? Artwork which predominantly features this character that they are personally attached to. But what if Kaimurama didn't take inspiration from Ash? What if they took inspiration from other pieces? Oh, you mean the other pieces that are also generally mostly comprised of Tirza's characters? Yeah, Tirza doesn't draw a whole lot of bowls of fruit. You see, I've discussed in the past how an artistic style isn't inherently just about the way a person draws bodies, but also their personal use of color, the themes present in their work, the line art, composition, perspective, all of that plays into a person's artistic style. But so do characters! Yeah, the characters that a person creates are a part of their artistic style. Not such in only how they're designed, but also in how they're written. Tirza, for example, uses a lot of blacks and whites with bright pastel colors, so a good chunk of Tirza's main characters have solid blacks, solid whites, and pastel colors. Tirza showcases artistic themes of abuse, the need for love, unhealthy obsession, body horror, questioning reality, religious iconography, rejection, the corruption or objectification of innocence, LGBT QA+, trust issues, and an overall combination of cute and horrific themes. Therein, Tears' characters end up in abusive relationships or else are abusers themselves. They thrive on attention, they hurt each other, they are gay, trans, non-binary, lesbian, they suffer from perception-altering mental conditions like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, they are priests or gods or demons, and they are designed to be cute but engage in or are victims of horrific circumstances or else they are designed to be cute but be horrible, disgusting people. The characters are a part of the art style, you morons! So, end result, inspiration is not a crime, artistic themes tend to carry over onto characters created, taking inspiration from an artist's work that primarily focuses on pieces of their original characters means that the characters are generally a part of the inspiration being drawn from, and uh, oh yeah, if you get so upset about someone taking inspiration from your work and characters, then you shouldn't be taking inspiration from theirs. In fact, if this makes you upset as a whole, then you probably shouldn't be taking inspiration from other artists, period. 
Obviously, there are instances where there are curators that are not aware of each other and their designs exist and they just happen to be similar, but T knew of me during the time they were making and selling these adopts. They knew and still took my design that I worked hard on and obviously adored a drawing. That's the issue. When you know someone has a design that is precious to them, but you steal and sell it anyway. Prove that Tirzel was aware the design was precious to you. If you're gonna go down this route of, if you know the character is personal, then it's horrible to steal it. Then you have to prove that Tirzel was aware that the character was personal to you. Were you aware that Ash was precious to Tirza? Which pieces of art did you take inspiration from so we can judge whether you were inspired by a piece that was too personal to Tirza? Good God, this is a stupid point. It's just insulting, to be honest, and they've witch-hunted witch people in the past for stealing their designs. They're a hypocrite and continue to pull this shit to this day. Oh, is that a fact? Why are all of your screenshots old then? Why are all of the instances that I've seen so far three or four years old, or else not dated and they're in potentially older? Look, Kaimurama, I'll play a game with you. You found Tears in 2016? All right. I went through all of the pieces featured on Tears' DeviantArt page from 2016 in search of comments from an account called Vampiric Arcana, as this was the account Kaimurama originally contacted me from. I managed to find four comments on Tears' 2016 artwork. Side note to that, I went backwards through Tears' 2016 art, and while I may not have mentioned it before, Tears up pumps out artwork. Despite my going through all of those images, there were only four comments from this account towards the end of 2016. So, we bit irksome, really would have liked some sort of I found them at the end of 2016, so at least a little bit of my time was saved, but that's just a petty complaint. In order, there were comments on the pieces Pinky posted October 6th, Owie posted October 20th, Choke Me posted October 22nd, and Make Up Your Mind posted November 2nd. Back then, you seemed to very much understand that the relationship between Ash and Bailey was not a healthy one, even indicating that you wanted to protect Ash. See, here Kaimurama might claim you can't bring up those old comments. They were three years ago, and my opinion has changed since then. Okay, so why are you allowed to bring up art and alleged behavior from Tirza that's three years old? Your views on Tirza have changed because you've changed and you've had different experiences. Why isn't Tirza allowed to change? Your bringing up these art pieces and issues implies that they are just as important to the discussion now as they would have been three years ago, which inherently implies that Tirza's mentality regarding this hasn't changed. If you had provided older things and then recent events to demonstrate that this was a pattern that had not let up or altered in that three year time frame, then things would be different. But that's not what you did. What makes this even worse is that in finding these comments from Kaimurama, I also came across this exchange from back in 2016, where Necroplanter points out that Ash has been getting taller and Tirza admits that they had been making a conscious effort to make Ash look more their age. So even going back three years, Tirza had acknowledged and was already in the process of fixing one of the issues you're bitching about. People don't seem to understand what about their art is triggering slash harmful. As mentioned before, they draw a lot of things that could be potentially sensitive to people. Self-harm, abuse, neglect, unhealthy obsessions, etc. They also poorly represent people of both the LGBT community and those who suffer from mental and personality disorders like bipolar and schizophrenia. People who happen to be both or either of these already have a hard time getting good representation in today's media. If you're going to include someone who has a disorder, please put research into it. Oh my god! Everybody please take a moment to acknowledge that Kaimurama has just made an additional claim and has not only provided absolutely no evidence, but also absolutely no examples. Show us a piece where Tirza gave bad representation. How do you know that Tirza hasn't put any research into it? How do you know that Tirza doesn't have experiences with it? Oh boy, don't worry, we'll come back to that point a little later. In the meantime, their art is triggering people. And... Oh, I'm sorry. Did you think that that was an illegal offense? Did you think that I would be sympathetic to it? Did you think that if someone's art is triggering it, therein can't exist on the internet? What are you, a fucking Karen? How the hell do you get it in your head that the artist should be held responsible for someone being triggered by their work? Tirza isn't going out of their way to show their work specifically to people who might be negatively affected by it. They're just posting it on their personal art pages where they are allowed to showcase their work. So Tirza is supposed to cater their artwork to whom they 
guests are going to randomly stumble across it. And if this isn't with regards to randoms coming across the artwork and Kaimurama is claiming that the people following Tears' artwork are triggered by it, then that's still not Tears' fucking fault. If a person recognizes that they have a trigger or they are being triggered by an artistic piece, it is not up to the artist to alter their work to remove this trigger. It falls on the person who recognizes that they have an issue to remove themselves from that situation. If people who follow Tirza are recognizing that they are being triggered by this artwork, then they shouldn't be following Tirza. A struggling alcoholic can't walk into a bar and demand that everybody stop drinking because it triggers them. Why the fuck do you think you get to go to Tirza's web pages where they display their art and demand them to change it because it offends yours or someone else's sensibilities? Are you insane? Censor everything, why don't you? Another thing that they tend to do along with the misrepresentation of LGBT people and mentally ill people is spread false information about sex workers and the like. They paint people who happen to be in this occupation as gross or unsanitary. Literally fucking when the main character Tears of Draws, based off of themselves, was canonically a sex worker. Getting real tired of your habit of just saying shit without backing it up, Meg. We don't want any more stigma around any of these things, and that is exactly what T is doing. They can't help but make their characters look young. Yes, they can. They can and have drawn adults before. They just don't do that with Ash, their main OC. Kaimurama, Meg, as someone who has been going over Tears' artwork for the better part of a month, I know that isn't true. From 2019 alone, that being the year your video was made, Tirza created all of these pieces, clearly with the intention of making Ash look older. And in case you were wondering, yes, these were all posted on Tirza's DeviantArt account before Kaimurama's video. Another fun note, I found out that Tirza actually posts their artwork way after it's originally done. Hell, those are just the obvious ones. These are others that are debatable, if only because of how partially cartoony or simplistic they are, and then others are just straight up chibis. This one actually looks like me. An additional note, because apparently it's not common bloody sense, but Tirza doesn't draw Ash the same every single time. The piece Redacted Title, for example, was made after the piece It's Lil Lil Bit, and before the piece Let Die, both of which were clearly drawn with the intention of making Ash look younger. Yeah, Tirza does draw Ash as a child sometimes, but why aren't you considering when and how this is done? Whether that be to convey innocence, to invoke disgust, to objectify, or just because it's cute. You're creating this broad generalization of Tirza never draws Ash their age, when Tirza's artwork actually demonstrates a wide variety of interpretations of the character of Ash, many of which, shock of all shocks, make Ash look their age. Oh, I totally did my research. Yeah, sure you did, honey. Like this character. This is their dad. He's an adult. Ash and their twin Elliot are legal, but are drawn like children. And T has explicitly said that they have children forms and look to be five or six years old in some cases. Oh, I'm so glad that this has finally been brought up. Remember when I mentioned that Ash Kinoshita had a doll form? This is what people are referring to when saying that Ash can canonically pass for a four or five year old. That's what this image from Kaimurama's first video is referring to. Ah, uh, but to last, there remains one teeny tiny itty bitty little problem with that. Ash's doll form doesn't have genitalia. Yeah. Just take a minute to soak that in. The form in which Ash canonically looks like a child, the one that these screenshots claimed was being sexualized and engaging with people sexually, is specifically designed to be incapable of doing the things they're claiming. There is no artwork that I have been able to find of Ash in their doll form engaging in sexual activities. So where the fuck did that claim come from? It's not that pornography has been drawn of this character in their doll form, no, it's that the doll form exists as an option and the character out of the doll form has been sexualized, but because it's the same person in two different forms, they count the sexualization of the human form as sexualization of the doll form. By that logic, anyone attracted to Beast Boy is into bestiality, or anyone attracted to Clayface is into fucking dirt. Ever drawn porn of Nell? Well, Nell has a child form, so I guess you sexualized that too. Sexualized human blinky, and that means you're sexualizing a rock. 
Guys, if Tirza isn't breaking the fucking law, why is it such a bad thing for them to give this character a form that looks like a child? Mimi, me, 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 Tia said they have child forms and look to be five or six. Yeah, but did T sexualize those forms like you're claiming they did? No, they didn't. They even removed the sexual parts of the character in that form. This form of the character has been relieved of the primary venue by which sexual abuse would generally occur. Tirza has established a design so that you can't fuck Ash in their doll form. What person intentionally trying to sexualize a character removes their sex organs? Screenshots to this were shown in my last video about them, so the excuse that they can't help drawing their characters looking young is bullshit. I mean, yeah, it is, but so is your whole video on the matter. How much is too much when focusing on self-harm and suicide in art? If that's something you want to focus on in a story, at least let people know what they're getting into. Have constant warnings that your work may have sensitive content. I think that focusing on it is a good idea if it's done in a healthy way. You mean like this? Or this? A bad example of this would be 13 Reasons Why. There happens to be a very explicit scene in which one of the characters self-harms and commits suicide, and many have reported wanting to relapse after watching that scene. Don't focus so much on it that it may cause others discomfort. Ah, so exactly the thing that Tirza didn't do. Because Tirza's art neither showcases nor focuses on the acts of abuse or self-harm. Rather, at least physically, the bruises and scars left behind. You know, you keep listing out these corrections to say it's okay for others to do something, but not okay for Tirza. But apparently you're not even aware of what Tirza's actually done. Who is M? For the safety of M, I will not be saying who they are, but I can let you know that they did respond to the last video I made. They are supportive of anyone and everyone who has been a victim of T's nasty behavior. Reminder, M is cat shops. We'll circle back to them again later on. Those happen to be all the questions I was able to get to. I'm sorry if I missed yours, but like I said before, the comment section was really messing with my head and I couldn't look too much into it. On an additional note, as I was editing the script on April 7th, I found that she has traced and copied my art for a second time. I was going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I was going to give them another chance if they wanted to redeem themselves and become a better person. But I'm just done. I'm angry and I'm upset. Oh, come on! Hey, guess what? This isn't traced. You want to know how I know? I went out and found the piece Kaimurama claims Tears are traced. And would you fucking look at that? The hips on Kaimurama's character had to be altered so that they would match up with Tears' art. Beyond that, no lines actually match up. The closest is the curve of the character's ribs. So... This one curve in Tears' art is similar to one curve in Kaimurama's art, and that means it's traced. Plus, you know, if your excuse for why the first video was so bad and why that evidence was lacking is because you were suffering from your mental health issues, then, uh, what's your excuse for this bullshit? I don't know about you guys, but I'm not aware of a mental health condition that compels people to Photoshop their artwork so they can claim somebody else traced off of them. Maybe I'm wrong. See why I said that Kaimurama was being kind of petty? Oh, I'm sorry. And what was that other thing that T traced? This time for your dick flattening image that you traced from a meme? Oh yeah, and don't think I didn't see you doing that again with Family Guy. Fuck off. I wanted to be finished, but they kept coming back to my shit. It's been almost two years since I've moved on from the knockoff style and pastel uwu cute aesthetic, but they can't seem to be original for once. <laughs> moved on from this art style, but Tirza hasn't. Sure, that makes sense. You've grown past this style of art, so that means that T needs to change it because you no longer personally think it's good. T, if you're watching this, leave me the fuck alone. I don't care who you send after me, or if you even come after me yourself. I'm not afraid of you anymore. When I commented on Kaimurama's video, they removed them. When I told Kaimurama I was doing this commentary, they blocked me, deleted their DeviantArt account, and later deleted their Twitter. Just saying. And I will not tolerate my art being ripped off by someone like you. I know you have the potential to be creative, but you've grown lazy and stagnant, and your art only 
has deteriorated over the years. This is Tirza's artwork from 2016 when Chimerama started following them. This is Tirza's artwork from October of 2019 when Chimerama's video was made. And this is Tirza's artwork as of 2020. End point, Chimerama doesn't know what they're talking about. If people want to argue that T's art is stagnant, fine. If they want to argue that it's repetitive, Fine, but you are actively deluding yourself if you somehow think that their 2020 work has deteriorated when compared to their 2016 work. Just be original for once. Please leave me alone. Leave me and everyone else alone. And then Kaimurama made a third video. This is completely unscripted, um, but I think it's important that I address it. That this is the last time I am mentioning them ever. I don't want to talk about them again. It's not even Dolly Guts or Salem or Dream Galley or whatever they go by. It's not even them that's bothering me anymore. It's people bringing them up. Da -dun. Da -dun. I turned the comments off not because I didn't want people to give me criticism. No, you just flat out ignored criticism if it said that your video was flawed. Or to respond, I was just tired of that being my most viewed video. I was tired of the comments hating on me when I never said to harass them. I don't condone that. The fact that people actually did go and do that makes me feel really bad. I, that was not my intention to make the video. So you feel bad that people harass T, but not that you willingly spread information that you'd been told was false, which at this point has encouraged other videos to be made against this artist and therein fueled that harassment. Omnia made three videos, one of which specifically cites your video and uses a clip from it. And like a game of broken telephone, Omnia's video spreads the same bullshit and misinformation. So you don't feel bad that you threw kindling onto the fire, but you're upset that it burns. My intention was to bring light to what they did, and that's it. <coughs> okay, well, you failed at that. Intentions aside, your actions involved you making claims against a person that you couldn't substantiate, some of which were flat out wrong, and you then ignored when you were told that what you were spreading was very likely wrong. I don't give a lick about what you claim your intentions were because frankly, I don't fucking believe you. If you wanted to get this right, you would have re-examined the situation when I told you it was necessary. Hell, you should have re-examined the situation before you made a video, period. It. You shouldn't just trust Kiwi Farms! To warn people um, about their behavior and their past because that comes into play now because they did not address it nor apologize. Sure, let's just expect artists to apologize publicly for every instance where they have wronged someone, whether that situation had been public or not. Let's further expect them to automatically know, I guess, that if they don't do this, those actions, whether they've grown and moved past them or not, are going to be thrown out publicly as a means of saying they're the same person they were when they made those mistakes. Kaimurama, I swear to all that is wicked and sullied in the world, if you don't get your ass back here after this video is released and apologize to T for what you did last October, then you don't get to complain that T didn't publicly apologize for past issues with friends that wasn't your business in the first place. They didn't apologize. Big deal. Some people are assholes. Move on. The fuck makes you think you then get to pull this victim blamey bullshit? And that's the re whole reason that I made that video. I did not make it to harass them or to send people to harass them. The fact that people did go harass them, and if you are one of the people that went to bother them out of- that- That was not what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to just simply avoid them. I accused this artist of sexualizing a child, but I didn't want anyone to approach them about it. In what world is that ever a thing that happens?
Okay, so for this next part, a little extra context is needed. The Kiwi Farms thread on Tirza that Kaimurama was using as one of her sources has, almost since the beginning, accused Tirza of faking their mental health conditions. This includes things like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, you know, generally what the character of Ash Kinoshita suffers from. There is, however, absolutely nothing to prove that Tirza fakes these conditions. It's simply speculated upon and then treated as though it's true. Tirza, earlier this year, posted a video in an effort to prove quote unquote their diagnoses. In it, they displayed papers that they implied to have been notes from a psychological evaluation. The video was short, vague, and overall most people were unconvinced that these papers were real, aside from some of T's fans, obviously. We all got that? Okay, cool. I did watch their diagnosis video. And the only response I have to that is the reason they even made that in the first place, or at least how it comes off to me, is one. This is the only point they expand on. There is no two. They were trying to prove that they did have these mental illnesses that the Kiwi Farms was stating they didn't. And checking it, um, there are still people questioning the legality of the papers themselves, but because there's literally no evidence to, to either point, I'm just going to go ahead and say, yeah, they probably have those mental illnesses and uh, diagnosis, you know, like, they, they have that. Okay, so now, when there's not enough evidence to show something, you'll give T the benefit of the doubt. Where was that when you were told that most of your original video didn't have proper evidence? I suppose this is carte blanche for me to give T the benefit of the doubt on every point that you have failed to prove, so thanks for that get out of jail free card, Kaimurama! Now it's extra dumb that you were so annoyed I was making this video. Now you can't be mad at me! Now despite Kaimurama admitting that she thinks it's likely T does indeed have the conditions that are being called into question, you might remember that in her second video she said, They also poorly represent people of both the LGBT community and those who suffer from mental and personality disorders like bipolar and schizophrenia. People who happen to be both or either of these already have a hard time getting good representation in today's media. If you're going to include someone who has a disorder, please put research into it. Oh, so that's the problem. All Kaimurama's saying is that Tirza just isn't doing enough research into how to portray these conditions correctly. There's a correct way to portray a character with these conditions, which is obviously a problem because of how frequent these bad portrayals are, and this is just made worse when paired with their problematic OCs, which seems all fine and dandy until you remember that Tirza's worst OC is Ash, you know, the character that T has said is specifically based on them. That character who shares Tears' mental health conditions. And what does Ash have? Oh, that's right. Schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. There you go, guys. We've gotten to the point where not even someone with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia is allowed to write a character who has bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Kill me. Guys, Kaimurama is the one proving her old videos wrong at this point. I'm just pointing the finger and laughing. Oh, well, at least Kaimurama isn't trying to go the route of disproving Tears' mental conditions. No one would be silly enough to do that. Goodness, you guys are so adorably naive. Yeah, Kaimurama might not have tried to claim Tirza faked her conditions. You know, after the part where she stated that Tirza needed to do research into these conditions, implying they had no experience with them. Oh, but somebody did, and they did it way more directly. Surprise. It's a secret double feature! Remember when I mentioned that Omnia had made videos citing Kaimurama's video as one of the sources of her information? Well, that wasn't the only video she used! Isn't that right? Inconspicuous Char. Oh, by the way, I'm not addressing all of Char's video, it's all pretty dumb, but I'm mostly just focusing on the complete absurdity of someone trying to prove that someone they do not know personally, only passively through the internet, is faking their mental health issues. Because yeah, that's the really annoying and uniquely destructive part, and I think we need to address it. If you cannot be asked to read, if you cannot be asked to inform yourself fully, you should not engage in the conversation unless you want to contribute to the disinformation. Knowing that they have said this, prepare to roll your eyes really hard. Another act of troglodytism is shielding dolly guts from criticism regarding self-harm. 
listen, I'm all for coping through art, coping through fiction. What I don't support is posting that content to a website where anyone with the mature content filter off is going to be exposed to it just opening the front page, including people who have a history of self-harm. If your Toy House account has to have these trigger warnings and helpline numbers on every single page before anyone can view any of it, then it shouldn't be on DeviantArt. Listen to me. People have started cutting because of Tears' art, and recovering cutters have relapsed because of it. You should not be okay with that. In Tirza's attempt to outdo cat shops, they eventually ended up making Ash so small that on several occasions, Tirza directly states that Ash passes as a five-year-old child or even younger, and the character is a prostitute. Do we see the problem here? Mid, 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 don't spread misinformation. You mean like the misinformation you're spreading by saying that T was sexualizing a character who passed for a child when in reality, T had drawn sexualized images of a character who can change their form into that of a doll that looks to be five and has no fucking genitalia and is based off of themselves. Or apparently blaming Tirza for people actively bypassing the warnings and systems that the artist has already put in place to avoid these works being mistakenly seen by those who don't want to see them. Yeah, sorry guys, but if the work is not against terms of service of the site it's being showcased on, which it's not, then why do you think you get to berate them for posting it there? They're clearly allowed to on the sites they're using. They're not posting the work where they're not supposed to. They are not forcing those who would be harmed by it to look at it. They are simply drawing it posting it, and then people are finding it. Likely because they already had a proclivity towards or interest in that art. Because yeah, if you like a certain type of art online, you're generally going to be recommended more of that type of art. As evident by the fact that Tirza was surrounded by a bunch of copycats who were copying them and mimicking the art style, thus creating a community of artists with similar styles and themes. Duh! Oh, but because we can find it, that's bad! Yeah, how about no? We're not doing that dumb shit! Get out of here with your hypocritical cherry-picking censors! I'm not in the mood! Tirza has been using an extremely poor and outright insulting mimicry of what is known as a flat affect to push their dead dolly persona on YouTube. Let me be very clear. A flat affect is not the same as a monotone. Having a flat affect is the inability to express emotions through your tone of voice, not talking in a monotonous robot corpse voice. It seems that Tirza was looking for more cool, quirky, schizo symptoms to pile on, found flat affect, and found that it is a common feature of autism, then lazily assumed that those were one and the same. People were quick to notice that this voice came and went sporadically, and Tirza was quick to, know, to make several videos excusing their behavior. Over the course of their channel, they have given a multitude of excuses. First, it was a symptom of schizophrenia, then it was a side effect of medications for the schizophrenia, then it was autism. When their voice changed back to normal the first time, it was because they had begun a new medication. It went flat again, and the next time it was normal, it was because they had gone to speech therapy. I will tell you now that this is ridiculous. Flat affect is not just talking funny. It's not just being bored. It is a fundamental developmental communication problem, which can take years of therapy to correct, and much trial and error and sounding ridiculous in the process. You have no idea how many years it took me as an autistic child to fix my voice and make it something people would not mock me for. Okay, now let me be very clear. 
You do not fully understand what a flat affect is, and I can tell this because with you having just said that a flat affect is not monotone, you've just excluded, unsurprisingly, one of the actual descriptors of a flat affect. In this context, monotone refers to one having a lack of inflection and tonal change in their voice. A flat affect is what's known as a negative symptom, and I'll go further into the specifics of that a little later on, wherein a person's outward emotional expression is dampened. This results in what appears to be an apathetic, low emotional manner of speaking with minimal tonal shift. That is exactly what a monotone is. Not only does a monotone speaking voice come up as one of the typical symptoms of a flat affect, in checking into this, I found videos of people with flat affects describing it as being monotone. And then they have the gall to be all, oh, this isn't hearsay, I have proof for everything. You don't have proof for any of this. You're entirely speculating that T is putting on a flat affect based only on your own understanding of it from the perspective of a person with autism. Oh, I dealt with it, so I know what I'm talking about. Obviously you don't. Which makes me wonder why you expect T to never misunderstand or make mistakes when talking about their own diagnoses when you evidently didn't know that a monotone voice is a symptom of a flat affect. I literally just looked up the definition and symptoms of a flat affect. This wasn't fucking hard to disprove. You assume T's mental health conditions are a lie based on nothing and then try to justify that assumption by analyzing their fluctuating affect as though you're a fucking psychoanalyst. A flat affect is not exclusively a developmental communication problem. It is a a lack of ability to communicate emotions visually and audibly through expression and voice. You can have a flat affect for other reasons. B, my artist, the sentient mass of tentacles making all of this shit, yeah, they exhibit a flat affect sometimes, because a flat affect is also a symptom of depression and can present itself more noticeably in the midst of depressive episodes. That means that not only is it not always present, it also fluctuates over time. Of course, Tirza's flat affect isn't going to be the same all the time. It's going to change with their mood. And yes, it could change as a result of the medication T's taking, which you snub off as though it's a ridiculous claim when you don't seem to even know what medication Tirza was on, so you you have no real way of knowing this. Inconspicuous Chara, why are you trying to refute T's diagnosis? You're not a psychologist. You're not a speech therapist. Struggling with a flat affect earlier in your life doesn't mean that you're any authority on judging what is or is not typical for those with this symptom. You having or having dealt with the condition does not grant you the qualification to diagnose it in others. And it certainly doesn't mean you can try to disprove someone else's diagnosis because their experience with one of their symptoms differs from yours. The the fact that it evidently needed to be explained to people that randos on the internet have no business attempting to diagnose someone online, not only within the context of people taking kiwi farms at face value, but also in making note that having a condition does not make you a doctor, is one of the most baffling things that people just seem to think is okay here. This is a disgusting mentality, and I'm honestly shocked that somebody thought this would fly. The flat affect also only happens to be one symptom of the many conditions that Tirza has claimed to suffer from. And yet somehow, the delusional idea that someone just Proving it means that Tirza is faking all of their other conditions is what's being promoted here. Conditions that, mind you, Inconspicuous Char doesn't have and therein can't speak on. Yet here, we just heard them try to disprove Tirza's schizophrenia. Why the fuck was this allowed? Why did people hear this and think that this was okay? And like, I wish I could at least just relish in the knowledge that Kaimurama didn't actively try to go that route, except for when she did. But then I remember that Kaimurama cited Kiwi Farms, which yeah, has actively been questioning these conditions and proposing them as being fake, so I really don't care. You want to passively implied in one video, claim you're not going to scrutinize it in another, and then cite a source that scrutinizes that very thing? You're all pretty gross. This is along the same lines as someone saying, it's fine that you have a mental illness, just so long as you don't insert literal symptom of that illness here, because otherwise you're toxic. Or because someone continued to demonstrate symptoms of a mental condition they actually suffer from and may or may not have been able to get professional help for this condition, that means that they are making no effort to correct it. <sighs> You guys know the drill. Wait for it. We'll get there. However, they have no pity. They have no pity from me. Because if you are going to defend yourself by saying how mentally unstable and ill you are, that is a horrible excuse. 
I'm just being honest. Reminder that this is referring to T making a video attempting to prove their conditions in response to claims being made on Kiwi Farms saying otherwise. When has Kaimurama actually shown T using their conditions as a way of excusing their actions? Answer, she hasn't. So why T defending the validity of their conditions from a bunch of randos in a forum that people, for reasons I can't fathom, trust the anonymous word of enough for it to be an issue, means that they're defending everything they've done Wow, this is, this is some other kind of reaching. Your mental illness is not an excuse for the actions that you have done. As someone who suffers from a lot of mental illnesses as well, my mental health does not determine how innocent I am. I've said and done things that are very, very bad. And I know for a fact that my mental illness probably did come into play, but it is not an excuse. You still did those actions. You still did all of that with the knowledge that what you were doing was wrong, okay? Just because it makes it a little harder does not make it impossible for you to apologize. I am aware that they attempted an apology a while back, but it was a shitty one. Lovely! Make me angrier, why don't ya? They need to get in contact with the person that they harmed personally and apologize. And yes, there will be a lot of people who don't forgive them because what they did was bad. But I encourage them to do that. Great, so you make a video forcing this situation that wasn't what you were portraying it as into the public light, prompting some sort of public acknowledgement from T to address those who have heard about it, but T is not supposed to make that public apology. They're supposed to go the private route and apologize to the victims behind closed doors, thus making it publicly look like T hasn't addressed the situation. Kaimurama, sit down. Because Yes, they did horrible things to me, but if they apologized and stopped what they were doing, I would forgive them. I'm not a violent person. I don't hold grudges. I've moved on. Moved on right off of DeviantArt and Twitter! That's why I'm making this final statement. Because I want to just say I'm done with them, and I don't want to ever talk about them again on the channel, so please, if you're gonna leave a comment, Leave it here. Don't leave it on my other videos. I'm just going to delete them because they... I don't want that vibe, that energy on my other videos. My other videos, I'm trying to keep positive. Reserve comments calling me out for the videos I've disabled comments on so I don't have to see the consequences of my actions anywhere else. The only reason I made those videos um, on Salem or I don't know what they go by now. The only reason I made those videos on them in the first place was simply because I had a personal experience with them and I wanted to make a, a warning, you know? Kamrama, if you had personal experiences to talk about with T, why didn't you just talk about your personal experiences with T? Why was each video bogged down with half ass not evidence from this and that corner of the internet? If you had just disclosed your personal relationship with T, how it made you feel, your issues with the character, or how things had changed with you since then, there would be nothing wrong with this video. No, instead, you tried to spread and give validation to stories that you couldn't verify the authenticity of. You used old examples of work and your subjective opinion of them, or even opinions you had leached off of forum users to make claims about their present day behavior. You perpetuated a false narrative that Tirza sexualizes a childlike form of their character. And while that all could have been explained with blind stupidity or gullible ignorance initially, what's more nefarious is you not only lying that you would remove your first video when presented with really only a fraction of the flaws within it, but you then layer removing the video as a last ditch effort to not receive the consequences for not doing your due diligence in the first place. You knew that some of what you were peddling was wrong. Not only did you admit that in later videos, you also drove a semi-truck over the arguments that you had previously made. And you're out here demanding apologies from T? It has nothing to do with wanting to harass them. I don't want them to leave the internet to stop posting their art. 
they are a talented artist. In fact, I still really like their 2016 art, despite how gross some of the pieces could be. There was a lot of effort put into them then. It kind of looks like they don't want to put effort into their art nowadays, and that makes me feel really bad, despite the type of person they are. Oh, my tentacle goddess! Who freaking cares? Why are you people so weirdly invested in tea improving in their artwork in the direction that you specifically want it to go? Fuck off! T has been improving. I can see the steps they've been taking in their anatomy a mile away. Just because they're not improving their art in the way that you or Kiwi Farms wants them to doesn't mean they're not improving, period. Who actually gives a shit if T improves? This obsession with demanding that Tirza accept this specific type of criticism could be fueled by a lot of things, but let's be real, it's just weird that people get angry if an artist they say has shit, problematic art doesn't listen to what they have to offer. I mean, Fuck, who are you to say that they're not putting in enough effort? Can Tirza not have different standards for what they want to do with their art? You want nothing to do with T, Kaimurama? Then why the hell are you making demands on how they should improve their artwork? You're not even going to see it! I am not apologizing for the videos I made, because I did intend to make those, and they are out there and they are going to stay up. <laughs> Unless... Salem decides to swallow their pride and become a better person. And clearly, Kaimurama, being the gold standard for morality and art, will judge when that will be. If they apologize to the people they hurt. Do they then have to come to you after they've privately apologized and personally proved to you that they have? if they stop stealing designs and selling them as adoptables. Your cases for which have generally been shit and the designs having already been changed. If they stop half-assing their commission work. Not only has there never been an effort to prove that, if people commission tea because of a fondness of their art, their opinion isn't suddenly overwritten because you think the artist half-asses their work. If they like the art and want some, they're gonna pay for the work and get some. That's how commissioning works. If they start overall just improving as an artist. See, not improve as a person, improve as an artist. So are you here demanding that Tirza conform to your specific standards for art or else have these videos up and spreading, frankly, disgusting information about them? I'll remove these videos when you improve your art the way I want. Woo, that is some based entitlement. Good lord, I am so done with you at this point. Kamurama reiterates that they don't hate T and wants to see them improve and whatnot, further commenting on her dislike for the situation spilling out into the comment sections for her other videos, so it's not really important. Although, there is one thing I want to touch on. Please stop harassing them. Just give them criticism. Please. Harassment doesn't get anyone anywhere, it only makes the artist feel worse and will probably drive them to do worse things. The lack of self-awareness is palpable. What part of any of this has been criticism? This entire fiasco has been you reciting what you read off of gossip forums and a shitty out of context Tumblr blog. Most of what you've claimed has either been completely lacking in evidence or it was something you managed to contradict yourself on in later installments, which is incidentally a trend that was also present on the Kiwi Farms forums. Because at some point, I got it into my head that I should read through the thread to see if maybe what you had to say was expanded upon in the over 300 pages of repetitive, contradictory, biased rumor mongering. I have to admit, Kaimurama, I'm a little curious why you thought Kiwi Farms would be a good resource for this. And that's even discounting the docs, which also existed on Kiwi Farms, by the way. I saw in the description at one point that you removed the Kiwi Farms link because of the docs information, but it was also on the Lolcow forums too from what I saw, so great work on that. See, when I was sifting through Kiwi Farms trying to find evidence for your video, I happened across such wondering sites included, but not limited to, acknowledging in 2018 that Tirza is a kid, their words, the claim that Tirza sent ketamine to a minor fueled only by someone saying it happened, the constant flip-flopping on whether Tirza is abusing their cats or not as a result of people saying, I know cats so, and then insert them either agreeing or disagreeing with the claim. Acknowledging that people put parts of themselves into their characters but using this only with regards to the very worst parts of a character and also asserting that these are only put in for boohoo edgy points which 
pick one. They're repeated to ad nauseum occurrence of people making a claim about the artwork only for someone to explain why that's ridiculous within a page of the claim being made. Nobody apparently cluing in on these being subjective interpretations of the artwork, which reflects less on Tirza and more on the beholder. Complaining that Tirza doesn't use enough color in their work and then complaining when they attempt to do just that because it's not good enough. Acknowledgement that the Bruce's and T's old artwork are a part of an aesthetic, but ignoring that for more recent pieces. Acknowledging there having been an increase in self-harm when Tirza started dating Bailey. Complaining about T not seeking to get help from a therapist, but later admitting that they had no idea of their insurance status or whether they had paid for their meds out of pocket. Claiming that Tirza never draws ash of age, but then ignoring when that is attempted in pieces in favor of criticizing the work for being ugly. Providing evidence that contradicts accompanying claims. Yeah, just as an example of how dumb this is, on page 58, a user named No Feline made a claim that Ash Kinoshita kept changing genders early on in their development, providing links to archive DeviantArt pages. But if you actually read the descriptions or comment sections for some of those pieces, No Feline's evidence either proves them wrong or else the art is drawn ambiguously and there's nothing that actually says what the character's gender is and it's essentially No Feline guessing. They claimed in order that the character started female, became a cross-dressing male, back to female, to cross-dressing female, back to male, and then then to quote, male with question mark, question mark, question mark pronouns. There's a comment that confirms that Ash started female for the first link, but the second link provided for cross-dressing male has a comment from Tirza referring to the character as a her. And the third link has T correcting someone who assumed the character was male. There was something in the description for the cross-dressing female claim that confirmed it, but nothing in the back to male claim. And then the male with question mark, question mark, question mark pronouns is just a result of no feline not being able to tell one way or the other, despite Tirza literally saying that Ash is a she in the description. Oh, and of course, let's not forget when they brought up the work of another artist, whom they acknowledge was actively drawing inappropriate images of a character the artist claimed to be a minor, and who drew a lot of images of minors with drug issues, using that to theorize this artist might have been mistreated as a child, but not considering that for T and T's artwork, and then using the exaggerated proportions of yet another artist's work to explain why why that work, despite having many similar visual design elements of Tears' character Ash, was okay, and Tears' art wasn't. And despite no feline giving three lovely examples all on their own, I went out and found more of this artist's work. So, if we're going by Kaimurama's standards and using Kiwi Farms as a resource for the rising of the torches against tea, then according to that resource, this artwork is not okay, but this is. This isn't okay, but this is. This isn't okay, but this is. I really hope that I'm getting across exactly why this entire thing is an issue. It's almost like you guys forgot that this is artwork we're talking about. Something that can be read differently by every person who looks at it. On top of that, Kiwi Farms has actively and openly mocked people with mental health conditions and the LGBTQA community in the past and continue to do so regularly. So why what they had to say about Tears' artistic interpretation of a character with the same mental health conditions they suffer from who was also LGBTQA LGBTQA+ were opinions we were supposed to use as a reference base here, I'll never know. This isn't even scratching the surface either. The issues I just listed were only the most glaring at a first glance up until page 58. This is your resource, Kaimurama? The one that you did oh so much research into. A glorified gossip forum? Your recounts for almost everything you've claimed against Tirza is testimony, fueled by testimony, and with nothing to prove it. If this is seriously what you consider to be research, then you need to go back to school. And so obviously, after all of that, I wasn't going to bother with the lol cow forums too. Mostly because it shouldn't have been my job to go and find something that even gave the smallest bit of credit to you your claims. That should have been your job, Kaimurama. If you're gonna choose to talk about how something is true and someone is being problematic, then you should have at least some basic idea of what you're talking about. I shouldn't have to go through hundreds of pages of gossip to see if you're right. And if you thought I was done because I'm finishing with Kaimurama's videos, haha, fuck you. Kaimurama still had one source listed, the Tumblr blog. The one from which she got all of the lovely out of context screenshots from who the fuck knows where. Well, for some of them at least, I knows where. See, most of these being from private conversations, there isn't an easy way to tell which ones, if any, are really credible. Luckily, the Tumblr blog included this, a screenshot of a Tumblr post. And while the names of all the blogs were 
counting all of these experiences are cropped out, the Tumblr post itself still exists on the site and continues to be reblogged to this day. Incidentally, by the same person who made that very first post, Risa Onda, otherwise known as Venus. And it was looking through this blog where everything started to finally come together. So since Kamarama's videos failed at proving the secondary claims against Tirza, as well as failing to explain the context behind where these primary accusations came from, and yet Kaimurama boasted to me about doing her research, I would like to offer up some criticism in the form of, here's how it's actually done. Here's what I found out. The first thing I need to establish is that while there are multiple different reblog threads originating from Venus's original callout post, almost all of the blogs claiming to have direct experience with being a victim of Tirza's originate from the same four people. Unfortunately, just like T, these guys tended to change names across a few different accounts, so for clarity's sake, we're gonna break down the players. To start off, obviously we have Tirza, other aliases include Dolly Guts, Faye Doll, Doll Claws, Dreamalgia, and most recently, Salem. Then we have the four main outspoken victims, Venus, Cat Shops, Swampert, and Nagita. Venus goes by the other names Risa Onda, Shabashubi, and Erika. Cat Shops returns, and on top of being called M, he also goes by Vincent, Splice Kid, and Gut Witch. Swampert uses the names Purple Swampert, Dimitri, and Moss Deep. And finally, Nagita Shinjiro just uses the name Nagita Shinjiro, and that's it. Be thankful to them. So that's T, Venus, Cat Shops, Swampert, and Nagita. Everyone got that? Cool. Most of what we're going to talk about in this section will pertain to Venus and to a lesser degree Cat Shops, as Venus's blog is one of the few that has remained active as far back as 2015. One of the first things you come across on Venus's blog is the Before You Follow page, which immediately explains their ties to Tirza. According to Venus, these two had been friends since they were toddlers, but if it were not blatantly apparent by this post even existing, they had a pretty bad falling out. From Venus's perspective, Tirza was both mentally and physically abusive for the duration of what they struggled to call a friendship. While Venus tells of knowing Tirza for that long, I'm only aware of Cat Shops and Swampert knowing Tirza since at least the age of 14, as Swampert recalls an instance where Tirza threatened suicide at that time, and the two are currently the same age. I don't know if Nagita was around for that point, they're like three years younger than everyone else. At some point, the group had a falling out and Tirza, having been in some manner of relationship with them at the time, took Cat Shops with them when the group went their separate ways. Cat Shops and Venus reconnected in April of 2015. On June 6th of that same year, Tirza contacted Venus with an apology, this being the, quote, only apology they ever received from Tirza personally, according to Venus. The next day, Cat Shops confirmed to Venus that they were no longer in a relationship with Tirza. I don't know exactly what sort of relationship this was. On July 7th, 2015, the name isn't explicitly stated, but from what I can tell, Cat Shops contacted Venus asking for Tirza's address, worried that Tirza was going to seriously harm themselves. During this conversation, Cat Shops and Venus discuss a previous alleged serious self-harm attempt, an instant where Cat Shops had to call the police and have Tirza institutionalized, possibly alluding to a forced institutionalization from earlier that year, one of the few instances where the information on Kiwi Farms was helpful, and an indication that both parties had become aware at this point that Tirza had mental health issues. After this event, Venus tells Cat Shops that they had been blocked by Tirza, who later went on to vague post about the group on Twitter, at one point compiling these claims in a thread titled, Things My Abusers Did To Me in August of 2015. Tirza's quote-unquote abusers in this instance would be Venus, Cat Shops, and possibly also Swampert and Nagita. While I'm unsure of the frequency, Tirza was apparently still vaguely referring to their quote-unquote abusers as of November of 2015. This allegedly continued until Venus hit their tipping point after Tirza posted something particular about Cat Shops, possibly a name drop, and on Tirza's 19th birthday, December 16th, 2015, Venus put up the first installment of the callout thread. Unfortunately, while I was unable to find the post prompting this because Tirza's original Twitter was nuked and there is no archive of this post that I can find, there does seem to be a corresponding post on Venus's blog from the day prior that makes note of this post existing and being an issue for Venus. Beyond this point, I don't think any of these guys have spoken to Tirza directly and vice versa. There's only been claims of harassment sent over. Mind you, both sides are claiming this. While Tirza rarely speaks about this publicly, they also don't really provide anything to prove their claim, so I can't speak on it. Venus, however, does provide some evidence. Some of it doesn't necessarily display exactly what's being claimed, but a Tumblr message showcases that someone asked Tirza who their abuse users were, and Tirza did answer this question publicly. Just a note on this, guys, I actually missed this the first time around, so this section is a quick correction. I'm not gonna go into this a lot because there's still technically a lot of context missing within the screenshot, so I don't want to make a huge opinion on it, but I do want it known that this does demonstrate Venus's claim that Tirza had publicly directed their fanbase towards people whom they claimed to be their abusers, which, you know, 
generally uncool thing to do. Don't ever do this. Gross. I don't know what date this happened, what was going on behind the scenes, or anything like that. Just know that, yeah, both sides have claimed that either side has directed harassment towards them, and Venus has been able to demonstrate that Tirza has done this in the past. Now, I need to specify, while I have discussed the timeline of events regarding the breakup between Tirza and this friend group, I am not going to argue the claims that Tirza was physically or mentally abusive to their friends. If T's ex-friends feel that they were being subjected to an abusive relationship, they are entirely within their right to end that friendship. No one should be forced or feel compelled to stay with someone who hurts them, makes them uncomfortable, or makes them feel like garbage. They are also entirely within their right to warn people of this behavior, should they feel it necessary, which obviously they did. Venus, Catshops, Swampert, and Nagita are allowed to talk on their personal experiences, just as Kaimurama is allowed to talk on her personal experiences. And just as Tirza is allowed to talk on their personal experiences. From what I can tell, there are a number of Tumblr posts that seem to confirm aspects of Venus's experiences, and I don't really have reason to distrust them because I doubt this group was planning to fake evidence in case they were scrutinized about it five years later. That's that's just kind of dumb. I believe Venus when Venus claims that T was mentally and physically abusive. I believe Swampert when he says he was traumatized by T threatening suicide. I believe Cat Shops when they draw vent art of T not apologizing, but then pressuring forgiveness. By extension, I basically believe all of the artists who claim to have had issues with Tirza. One is an instance, two's a coincidence, three is a pattern. More than 10? Yeah, probably an issue. Here's the crux of that, however. There are always two sides to every story and outside of the now long deleted tweets and posts from Tirza's Twitter and Tumblr respectively, we don't actually get a glimpse into Tirza's side of the situation. At least, not from T's end. I bring this up primarily because Venus's blog ended up posting things that brought this to my attention and why that other perspective might be necessary here. Remember when we discussed Tirza's mental health issues, specifically schizoaffective disorder and bipolar disorder, which, quick note on that, is probably actually just bipolar type schizoaffective disorder, schizoaffective disorder, is recognized by symptoms of schizophrenia paired with a mood disorder, either bipolar type or depressive type. I found an archive of Tirza's old Tumblr that mentioned this condition specifically, and we know that Tirza refers to this disorder as such presently, so I think it's likely these two are really just the one condition, and this has been misconstrued either because of people's lack of understanding of the diagnosis or because of internet telephone. So I'll just be addressing it as bipolar type schizoaffective disorder beyond this point. Anyway, Venus has, in the past, reblogged two Tumblr posts from users with mental health issues. One user clarified that they were a part of a multiple system, which refers to dissociative identity disorder, and that they suffered from schizophrenia, while the second user's condition was unspecified. On the same day that Venus posted their original callout on T, they were blogged an add-on to said post from the user Nuclear Throne, which recounted their personal experience with T. Before we delve in, I want to preemptively apologize for the length of this, but I feel as if there's a lot within this post that really needs to be considered. I had them, T, on my blacklist, I recently put them back on, and apparently they found me through one of their victim's blogs, most likely. When they did, they proceeded proceeded to send me messages saying, why am I on your blacklist? I don't know why unless you're friends with my abuser. Not too long after, they sent another message saying something along the lines of, please remove me and don't mention me to anyone, which was confusing to me because I would ask people to tag them without context or saying that they were bad in the past. I would simply ask for them to be tagged because their art and stuff made me uncomfortable. I only ever warned friends and even then I was very strict about telling them not to post about it because I didn't want want any drama to be started. Either way, I got panicked, and since I am a member of a multiple system, another member fronted to try and take care of it for me. For some reason, Tumblr wasn't allowing him to send messages to them privately, which led the one fronting at the time to thinking that it was a glitch with Tumblr that wouldn't be fixed. He attempted to make a public post apologizing and saying that it was for personal reasons and that he would like it if the user not message me anymore if I removed them from my blacklist. After that, I was told that they vagued about me on their Twitter, saying that I was vague about them when the other headmate couldn't respond privately, and if he did, we still would have probably been a target for their harassment considering I am friends with one of their abusers, which is a lie since my friend is the victim and not the abuser. After a while, my schizophrenia started to act up too. To put it lightly, it started causing me to panic and think that they were going to send their followers after me to harass me as well as vague about me more on their Twitter. At a point, I recall being told of them mentioning that they were going to name drop on their private Twitter too. 
which fueled my panic state as well. I left a URL, hid my blog, and cleared my posts because I felt unsafe. I got restless and wasn't eating properly during this to the point I nearly made myself sick, and my lover could tell I was very, very scared considering I was in a call with them daily. I just thought considering everything, it's okay for me to post about this now. Please do not follow that user. Please do not message them or give them attention. They don't deserve it. They shouldn't be allowed to hurt more people or hurt people that are indirectly involved. I never posted about them before the blacklist thing. I simply had them on my blacklist and they suddenly contacted me about it. Got all that taken in? Don't worry, it doesn't matter. I'm basically going to break everything down into delicious little bite-sized candies for you all. Firstly, we know that T has cited five URLs who they claim to consider the main group of those who have abused them. For now, we'll ignore the possibility of repeat URLs and we'll just assume that these are five totally separate people. Nuclear Throne clarifies for us that they are indeed friends with one of their abusers, referring to T. So while maybe not a friend of Venus directly, Nuclear Throne is close enough to the friend group that Venus can choose to vouch for them. Plus, you know, if Venus reblogs it, I'm assuming it's because it's something they agree with and so want to share. So we can reasonably assume that Venus is agreeing with and promoting the sentiment in this post. Yes? Cool. Now take a breath because we're about to dive into the other end of this. As Chimerama has agreed, Tirza likely has schizoaffective disorder as they claim, which means those affected can have both the symptoms of schizophrenia and those of a mood disorder. Nuclear Throne here helpfully describes to us some of the effects that schizophrenia symptoms can do to a person's thought process. They became so terrified of the notion of harassment from Tirza. Mind you, harassment that, as far as we are aware of from this post at this time, did not happen. This fear is despite Nuke indicating Nuclear Throne Throne's a bit of a mouthful, so I hope you like the nickname, that T found them through one of their victim's blogs most likely. So we know that T and Nuke have never actually even met or interacted with one another before this point. If we agree that T has schizoaffective disorder, then for this next part to make sense, I must first clarify what that condition entails for the person suffering from it. I'm also going to go over the other conditions that Tirza has claimed to have, binge eating disorder, borderline personality disorder, and autism. Schizoaffective disorder takes the psychotic symptoms of schizophrenia and those of a mood disorder, for this instance in particular, the bipolar type, and mashes them together into the same mental illness. In the category of psychotic symptoms, those afflicted can experience hallucinations, sensory perceptions that don't match reality, such as hearing voices, delusions, something that is strongly but falsely believed, disorganized speech or behavior, cognitive disturbances that affect speech or thought process and therein communication, negative symptoms, a variety of things that are present in healthy persons but numbed in those afflicted, including a lack of motivation, reduced emotional reactivity, the inability to experience pleasure, and lack of speech. Unlike the psychotic symptoms, the symptoms of the mood disorder come and go in episodes, so periodically those afflicted will demonstrate symptoms which include racing thoughts, changes in appetite or diet, insomnia, elevated mood, euphoria, irritability, impulsivity, decreased need for sleep, concentration issues, increased goal-directed activity, impaired judgment, inflated self-esteem, restlessness, and depressive episodes. Borderline personality disorder is another condition that affects the way a person thinks about themselves and others, and some of the most commonly understood ways this manifests is through issues with self-image, a hard time regulating emotions, and unstable personal relationships. Symptoms for BPD include an extreme fear of either real or imagined abandonment, which can manifest as quickly getting physically or emotionally intimate, or abruptly cutting off communication with a person out of fear of being abandoned. Intense or unstable relationships with family and friends, which can range from obsession or idealization to heightened dislike or anger. Pervasive feelings of emptiness, a short fuse and inappropriate feelings of anger, stress-related paranoia and loss of contact with reality, Reality, impulsivity, which can result in the indulgence of dangerous behaviors such as reckless driving, spending sprees, substance abuse, binge eating, etc., recurring thoughts or threats of self-harm, personal injury, or suicide, sometimes initiated by fears of rejection, difficulty trusting people, or sometimes a fear of the intentions of others, intense moods that can last between a few hours to a few days, and self-harming behavior. Binge eating disorder is characterized by periods of extreme food intake, the urges for which can be extremely difficult to resist, often accompanied by intense shame. The condition displays symptoms that include eating large amounts of food in comparatively short periods of time, eating despite not being hungry, eating despite being full, eating in secret or alone out of embarrassment or shame, feelings of being unable to control how much is eaten, feelings of disgust, depression, or shame after overeating, decreased sexual desire, low self-esteem, and frequent dieting. And finally, autism, which is a spectrum disorder, and so I can't be entirely sure where on that spectrum tears arrests and there and what symptoms would be the most prominent. However, autism comes comes very little into play here, so it's not as much of an issue. Now, with all of that in mind, let's consider this interaction 
from Tears's end. From Nuke's perspective, T quote unquote suddenly contacted them regarding T's name being blacklisted, supposedly with no prompting. However, Nuke has also admitted to warning their friends against T, and while Nuke mentioned strictly not to post about the situation publicly, when T messaged them, Nuke claimed that T said, please remove me, referring to the blacklist, and don't mention me to anyone. That second request, paired with Nuke admitting to warning people of T behind the scenes, means it's possible that T could have heard that this was the case because gossip is a thing. So T either comes across Nuke because they run in similar artistic circles or because they heard about the warnings from someone else. According to Nuke, they send messages asking why and assuming Nuke to be connected with one of T's alleged abusers. As there's no indication of this and it goes against the latter half of the recounting, I assume these messages were sent to Nuke privately. Another member of Nuke's multiple system then put up a public post apologizing, clarifying this was for personal reasons and that if the user stops messaging them, they would remove said user from the blacklist. Problem with that. Did this post make note that the multiple member was unable to respond privately? Because if not, then from T's perspective, they tried to reach out to someone privately and that person then responded by vague posting about them publicly instead of responding. So on one hand, Tirza potentially wasn't told that Nuke allegedly couldn't respond to them privately, they're just supposed to know this. On the other hand, the post did mention this, but why would T believe it? Even Nuke themselves indicates that they aren't aware why Tumblr was doing this, summing it up to for some reason. So Tirza is either just supposed to know or believe that conveniently for some reason at the time when they were asking for something to be dealt with privately, Tumblr just happened to stop working so that Nuke couldn't comply. This is already a dumb thing to expect someone to just come to on their own or believe. But then you've got Tirza who struggles with BPD and schizoaffective disorder and who might not even have been aware of it at the time that this happened, and they're supposed to be able to come to this ridiculous conclusion and it's now unreasonable and bad that they didn't? This makes no goddamn sense. Half of this post doesn't even have anything to do with anything T did. Nothing about this shows that Tirza ever claimed they were going to post about Nuke publicly. Nuke just recalls someone else telling them they heard Tirza mention it. Beyond that, everything else is the result of Nuke's schizophrenia symptoms causing them to worry. Oh, and wait a moment. That that's right, T also suffers from psychotic symptoms that cause delusions and intense emotional periods that can last for days. <laughs> now of course, I'm not saying that Tirza suffered the same or a similar delusion or even at this time. I'm saying that someone who suffers from delusions that contradict reality was asked to either believe something that not only doesn't make sense but also had no specified reasons for happening or else is just supposed to know about it without being told and then within this post is framed as the villain for vague posting about someone who did it to them first. Am I missing any? Anything here? No! At the very least, I can give this group the benefit of the doubt because I'm pretty sure they were not aware of all of these conditions back then, even if they might have been aware of some of them. I'm just pointing this out for the sake of hindsight. And before anyone gets to the mental illness doesn't excuse Tears' actions, oh don't worry, Venus's other post helps us with that one too. Roughly four months later, on April 15th, 2016, Venus reblogged the post Why Mental Illness Doesn't Excuse Abusive Behavior from the user ED Cynic. While not specifying the exact nature of their personal mental struggle, they listed some of their past toxic and abusive behavioral tactics. Slapping, name calling, throwing furniture, guilt tripping, shaming, being extremely possessive, jealous and resentful, texting and calling at inappropriate times and responding to a lack of response with suspicion and hostility, and blaming her husband for her shortcomings. Edie Cynic also clarifies that this is a short list of her offenses. This then circles back around to Venus since we already know that Venus has made the claim that Tirza has been and always was abusive to them, both physically physically and mentally. Here we get a very clear impression that Venus believes that accountability for your actions, whether they be the result of mental health issues or not, should be acknowledged, apologized for, and repaired rather than excused. Ah, but of course there's a problem with this as well. See, the post from Edie Cynic that Venus reblogged says this. To make it perfectly clear, there was nothing my husband ever did to warrant or justify any of my behavior. That man has never hit me, yelled at me, manipulated me, shamed me, called me names, become jealous, kept me from spending 
spending time with other people, etc. He's treated me like a queen for the last 11 years, and it wasn't until I did some deep recovery work that I realized 100% of my behaviors had all to do with me and nothing to do with him. I'm surprised he stuck with me, and although I am eternally grateful that he did, it took a long time for me to not only make amends to him, but to change my behaviors in order to finally come to a place of sanity within my relationship. The post goes on to specify that her husband deserved none of what he got and that nobody should be forced to stick around and deal with abuse just because the abuser suffers from a mental health condition, which is completely true. Even if the goal in sticking around is to help the person suffering, you can't help someone to swim if you yourself are drowning. I don't want anyone to misconstrue that. That being said, there's one line in particular I want to draw attention to. He's treated me like a queen for the last 11 years, and it wasn't until I did some deep recovery work that I realized 100% of my behavior had all to do with me and nothing to do with him. While it's not specified what condition E.D. Cynic suffers from, we at least know that whatever it was, it was something they were unable to recognize for perhaps at least the 11 year period they have been with their husband, as well as something they had to go through some deep recovery work before they could fully recognize the issues. Okay, so has... Tirza gone through a period of deep recovery work? I agree with Edie Cynic's sentiment that you are responsible for your actions regardless whether they're the result of mental health and that no one should be made to put up with abusive behavior. But for the sake of being fair, I also have to point out that Edie Cynic is drawing on past experiences. They're addressing this issue and their behavior through the lens of growth and hindsight. A point which apparently took a decade into her marriage for her to even reach. So if we assume they're married at 20, that would make this person, what, late 20? early 30s. Meanwhile, T has just turned 19 four months prior. So Venus is taking the after deep recovery work recountings of someone potentially more than a decade older than them and applying it to T as a means of saying that T should also be held accountable for their actions. Despite, you know, not not having that life experience and potentially not having gone through the recovery period ED Cynic had to. And we know that Venus is applying this to T because of the use of the at Tiza hashtag that Venus uses to talk about or refer to Tirza on their blog without directly tagging them. I'm not bringing this up to shame Venus or to imply that Venus is wrong to expect some accountability. They're not. It's totally reasonable, especially believing what Venus, Catshops, Nagita, and Swampert might have gone through. They deserve to be able to heal. But shouldn't T also be given the opportunity to get better. You guys don't actually think that someone with perception altering afflictions that damage their ability to trust others and view themselves in a healthy way is going to immediately believe everything without question when they're told that they're abusive. You can't actually think that, right? No, they're going to defend against it. They're going to fight back. Most people do that. When a person is accused of being something that is socially taboo, their first instinct is almost always to deny and disprove it. Even if it is true, people don't generally like thinking of themselves as the bad guy, so they're going to mentally deny it or project. It can take time for a person to come to terms with their own bad behavior, especially if they're vehemently denying that they're the one in the wrong. It's not time that those who might have been abused by them have to stick around for, but it's still time you should acknowledge as being necessary in the recovery process you're demanding. People have to realize there's an issue before they can fix it, and that point of realization can be different for everyone, and they're probably less likely to realize it if it's being pounded into their head through harassment and people telling them their art is bad. Chimerama. Again, no shame towards Venus here. I'm just bringing this up to demonstrate that even from the very beginning of this situation, Venus has been unable to address things from an unbiased perspective, which, again, I can't blame them for. I mean, they were also only 19 at this time. But since Venus is our presenter, it becomes an issue. They reblog, they're in supporting and giving credit to Nuke's post about their experience with T, bringing to attention the effects of Nuke's condition, but also failing to acknowledge that at almost any given moment, T could be experiencing something similar and become unable to shake those false beliefs, just as Nuke was. They support a post that acknowledges mental health issues do not excuse abusive behavior, but completely overlook the fact that T likely would not have been in a position to make this revelation possible, as was described in the post at the time Venus was expecting it. I'm not saying that it didn't happen or that Tirza should not take responsibility and apologize for it, but I am saying that it's unreasonable for Venus to expect an 18-year-old Tirza 
Lisa, who might have just been diagnosed, to have enough of a grasp on how their conditions affect their behavior that they can avoid these negative outbursts. Although, minor side note on that, so someone with mental health issues needs to take responsibility for their actions as a result of their symptoms, but suddenly, when it's convenient to make Tirza look bad, now nuke schizophrenia, causing them to fear and retreat from online communities that was initiated by gossip they hear from someone and not from anything Tirza actually did, now it's okay to include it in a post talking about how Tirza is awful and people need to stay away from them, despite the fact that Tirza should not be held responsible for that? Okay. Was Tirza even aware that Nuke suffered from mental health issues? Like, come on, guys. Shockingly, I don't expect an 18-year-old to be able to self-reflect enough that they can differentiate between and recognize abusive behavior on their end. Much less so if their interpretation of reality is peppered with delusions and unpredictable long stretches of manic or depressive episodes. That's what therapy is for, and we have no means of telling whether Tirza was seeing a professional at this time. If you acknowledge that it can take years for someone to get to the point of being able to understand that their mental health is causing behavior that harms others, and that's only after being diagnosed, then why is Tirza expected to already be at this point? I'm sorry, but humans just don't tend to work that way, and even less so if they're suffering from mental health conditions. Now, as we've seen when going over the time of this friend group, Tirza apologized for their past behavior after reconnecting with Venus, only for there to be another negative outburst from T, which Venus characterizes as them, quote unquote, doing the same thing again. Venus uses this to demonstrate that between when they and Tirza first parted ways and the event after their reconnection, T hadn't made an effort to change. Well, five years have now passed since that incident, which gives T plenty of time to address their behavior, right? T hasn't tried to apologize for their behavior, so bringing up these high school events are still necessary, right? See, that's where we get into other problems. T has tried to reach out and apologize. Obviously, neither T nor Venus can contact one another directly. As far as I'm aware, they both have each other blocked. And so, according to screenshots provided to us by Venus themselves, T did attempt to send an apology via a messenger. The problem here is that Venus didn't accept the apology. Oh, but Ponder, that's unfair. Venus doesn't have to accept the apology. No, 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 you are absolutely right. Venus is under no obligation to accept Tirza's apology even if T has changed. Except that doesn't mean that Venus gets to demand more apologies. See, as of September 21st, 2019, Venus was sent a message by a throwaway blog delivering screenshots of an apology from Tirza directed towards those whom they'd hurt. I'm not gonna say anything regarding whether this apology was sincere or whether Venus reassess it. Doesn't matter, it was written in like 15 minutes and regardless, Venus is allowed to consider the apology inadequate. But this does demonstrate that Venus was sent an apology. Venus didn't like the apology and chose to reject the apology, but they were sent an apology, at least as of September September 21st, 2019. I'm also not going to speak on whether the alleged other more personal apologies were ever sent. Beyond that, I also have to point out a potential oversight on the part of Venus. Remember when I mentioned that Venus and T had not spoken to one another since the day after the alleged not alive attempt on July 9th, 2015? Well, that's the issue we run into when Kaimurama poked her head into the situation. See, Kaimurama was using information from Venus's callout post, which had been co-opted into a larger Tumblr blog, which Kaimurama linked as a resource. The information provided within those posts were either three to five years old or else lacking a date completely and cropped to such a degree that it couldn't be adequately trusted. Now, in having found the original post, understanding the context behind why said post was made, and through going over the other posts related to this situation and Venus's feelings on it, we've come to realize that Venus hasn't actually had any interactions with T for half of a decade, which begs the question. How can Venus actually be sure that Tirza hasn't changed? See, Venus primarily argues that because T only distanced themselves from the situation and never addressed it publicly. In fact, the only things they cite as the reasons they believe T hasn't changed are the lack of a personal apology and the fact that Venus continues to get hate they claim was sent to them by Tirza sending fans out to harass them. Except there's no actual proof of this. It's simply what Venus believes to be the case. And the oversight? Well, while Venus seems to think the harassment regarding their opinion of T could only be directed by T themselves, there happens to be another way that people could infer their opinion on Tirza. Uh, 
find their blog. Yeah, remember the before you follow page that Venus has on their blog? The thing that if you click it, the first thing you're greeted with is an extremely long post detailing Venus's issues with tea? The very first thing that Venus directs people to when coming across their work is their relationship and opinions of Tirza, this much more popular artist that seems to run in similar artistic circles. Guys, if I was able to find Venus's blog just by looking for the original Kahlo post, it's not a stretch of the imagination to think that other people could find Venus's blog by finding its connection to T and then send them hate. I know that people can do this. I have friends who do this. They're freakishly and shockingly good at sussing out the details or finding the origin of a post even if you don't give them the whole thing. Hell, that might not even be necessary because Kiwi Farms brings up Venus's blog at some point. It's not on the first page page to be sure, you would have to do a little digging, but it's in there. So even through Kaimurama's own resource links, you could find Venus. It takes like max 20 minutes to find Venus through the call out post, and that's being generous. There's no actual way to prove that any of this harassment came from Tirza. I mean, sure, I think it's very possible that back at the end of 2015 when this was at its peak, T might have sent people to harass this friend group. But Venus is wrong to assume that whatever harassment they got beyond that point was directed by T personally and they're in proof that T wasn't changing for the better. There are other ways that fans of T could have found Venus and fans don't always need to be directed when they find a post talking negatively about a creator they like. Sometimes they just be rabid. <laughs> on the bright side, this gives us an idea of one of the potential places that might have started the whole T draws borderline pedo art thing because Venus makes that claim too. Also citing the instances where T draws Ash in their doll form and makes note that this form looks quite young as a means of claiming T's work on the character is generally problematic. Yeah, you're still wrong about that. Actually, this is where I get to really enjoy that Venus is using Princess Peach as their channel icon because it let me notice this. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I happen to know that a lot of uh, suggestive art of Princess Peach exists. So uh, I guess anyone who's ever found Princess Peach attractive is attracted to tiny humans. It's not like these are cartoons that don't perfectly mirror reality and that interpretation is a thing and that the further from reality a character design is, the more personal interpretation has to go into the character and oh wait, that's exactly what this is. These guys want to talk about how T's art is, in their words, borderline pedophilic. But this is a perspective gained by outsiders looking in on the piece with no attachment to the character and, as with the gossip forums, people who have a direct bias against or want to complain about T. I mean, Fuck, if you really want to argue that the work is problematic, then you should be considering the perspective of the person who drew it. You know, get in the mind of the offender and all that jazz. If Ash is based on Tirza, or what Tirza wants to be, it could be speculated to some degree that T was vicariously living or expressing themselves through the character of Ash Kinoshita. This would mean that various pieces of Ash could be interpretive mirrors of what T wants to be, wants to be seen as, wants to create, wants to be treated like, etc. Now we've already discussed their not being any image provided showing T sexualizing this childlike doll form of Ash, and that forms lack of sex organs, which, as I mentioned earlier, is much more akin to age regression. However, if we speculated for the sake of argument that such images did exist, then if they reflect the artist's views or wants, then the artist would not be sexualizing children as a whole, they would be sexualizing themselves as a child. Which, far as I'm aware, that's not how pedophilia works. I tried looking into this, but I'm gonna be real with you guys, I had no hecking idea what to look for. The closest thing I could find is the term autopedophilia, but outside of the definition of the word, I could only find it used in reference to a study done by Kevin J. Sue and J. Michael Bailey called autopedophilia erotic target identity inversion in men sexually attracted to children. Except if you read the abstract of that study, it becomes really apparent how flawed it is from the get-go. What with this being a study of less than 500 participants, executed through means of an online survey, who were already acknowledged pedophiles. And don't you dare think I don't see that line saying that the results support the concept of ETIIs. Yeah, ETIIs are only a hypothesized paraphilia referring to someone deriving sexual arousal from imagining themselves in another physical form. If that wording sounds a little off to any of you watching, you're not alone and unfortunately both of our worrisome predictions were proven to be right as the study goes on to refer to autogonophilia and apotemnophilia as secondary paraphilias considered. 
Blanchard. For those unaware, autogynophilia is a term coined by Ray Blanchard, a sexologist whose papers have been, let's just say, contested. Although gender identity disorder is not the same thing as sexual orientation, gender identity disorders are always associated with one or another of two erotic anomalies, either the erotic preference for members of one's own sex or the erotic desire to become like a member of the opposite sex. Why I teach about this, I explain why I can understand that someone who's transgender might take some umbrage at that, let's say, uh, the description. But why do you feel that people got so upset over this characterization? Well, I, I think it's important to point out that not every single patient of this type got upset at it. Very important, very uh, important. I was back channeled many times over the years by people who said, thank God I finally read a description that fits my experience. What a relief it's been to me. But those are the ones who tend to back channel and not to go online. The ones who went online, I think it was offensive to them in two ways. I think it kind of invalidated the fantasy they were building up about themselves. It contradicted their notion of themselves. They really wanted to go with the woman trapped in a man's body. Body, which often became lesbian trapped in a man's body. They wanted to go with that. And although I never ever said this type of transsexualism is nothing but a sexual fetish, that was how they read what I was saying. What I said was, this is the foundation, the basis. This particular erotic preference gets the ball rolling, but this type of sexual preference, which I called autogynophilia, can result in a gender identity inversion that has much broader ramifications. So a conceptually flawed paper based on the works of a transphobe. Where am I? Who are you? How did I get here? Can I leave this rabbit hole? To get back on point, I'm sorry, but I think it's super unfair to expect Tirza to apologize publicly for what they did to their high school group of friends. It's not the business of T's audience or anyone other than those involved. So why should T apologize publicly? Because they can't reach out to you personally? Remember guys, as far as we're aware, these two are blocking each other. And actually, as an aside to that, isn't it generally seen as a no-no if you bypass the block that somebody has put on you so that you can contact them? Even if it was for an apology, I've always been of the understanding understanding that this was a social taboo except for in very particular circumstances. Venus has demanded that T leave them alone on multiple occasions, but is also stipulating that if T is unwilling to, can't, or won't apologize privately, then they should do so publicly. So because Tirza is actively avoiding someone who claims they want absolutely nothing to do with them, they should admit to shit behavior from when they were a teenager that they may or may not have made an attempt to correct to an audience who otherwise would have been completely unaware of these past events. Venus even creates an ultimatum that once they feel they no longer need to warn people about Tirza, then they would remove the post. Incidentally, the same thing Kaimurama did. But Venus has already indicated to us that they don't pay attention to T and don't interact with them. So how are they supposed to know if or when T changes? Do they just expect to hear it as gossip one day? Assuming T even would choose to apologize in the first place, you're forcing them to make a public apology because they can't apologize to you in private. If neither of you want anything to do with Tirza, then why are you publicly calling them out and demanding they return to you for permission to have these posts removed? You're expressly setting up a system where Tirza would be forced to interact with you. Now, Venus argues this notion by saying that T made things public first and therein it's totally reasonable for them to expect a public apology, which unfortunately I can't really give as much credence to as I assume people would like. We don't know the date of the Tumblr post that we've been provided. The Twitter messages seem to have also been answered privately and we don't have dates for them. The alleged name drop of cat shops that initiated the creation of Venus's callout post in the first place? We've never actually seen a screenshot of that. Even the notion that this was entirely private before this point is questionable, as not only did cat shops on their gut witch account post event piece relating to their breakup and subsequent rejection of T's apology, the post that Venus reblogged from Nuke also comes up because Nuke mentioned having gone behind the scenes to warn people about T, or else to indicate that they should be blacklisted, which let's be real guys, who gets told you should blacklist this artist and doesn't immediately ask why? So I hold extreme reservations over the notion that Nuke did not talk about what T had actually done or else what they had 
had believed them to have done. From what I can tell, Venus was also vague posting about Tirza as far back as August 29th, 2014, more than a year before the callout happened and slightly less than a year before Tirza would reach out to reconnect. And then, after the July incident and T blocking this group of friends, you've got all of these posts vaguely referring to incidents with Tirza, while Venus simultaneously condemns Tirza for vague posting about the group. Here are 35 of said vague posts. These are only from a month. This is the equivalent of vague posting about T every day for a month. And these are only the ones I was relatively sure from whatever context was given were talking about T. There's a minimum of 60 of them from August 29th leading up to the call out post on December 16th. Oh look, and now we can date when this screenshot happened because Venus was vague posting about it on the 22nd of August, 2015. You know, vague posting, the thing that Tirza was being lambasted for on their Twitter. Yet now we can see that Venus appears to have also been vague posting about Tirza at the same time. It's also weird that Venus would claim that the abuser they're citing here would still use threatening self-harm and not alive to guilt their victims into staying with them when the person whom Tirza had done that to, Cat Shops, had been completely cut off at this point. I'm not gonna argue that T didn't do this in the past, but by the time Venus Vig posted about it, that relationship had already ended and T had already broken contact with everyone in this group, so Venus couldn't have actually been sure of that at this point. So yes, it's completely unfair to demand the apology be public because T made things public first, when it very much looks like that might not have been the case. How do we know that Nuke wasn't spreading that blacklist recommendation about T before T ever knew? name drop cat shops. They cited their experience with T as a past event, and this was a day after Venus posted the call out, which allegedly happened a day after the name drop, which yeah, it looks like that happened first. So people are allowed to spread what are essentially rumors, because there's not a lot of great evidence, about T privately behind the scenes, but the minute things go public, that's going too far. Normally, I would agree with that had Venus not previously been condemning Tirza for spreading their names in what clearly were private posts. And even then, privately trying to take down a person's name and spread rumors about them is still kind of not great, and I can't really blame Tirza for trying to quell that. Either it's okay to do, or it's not okay to do. And if it's not okay to do, then both sides are guilty of this offense, period. To be completely clear. I'm not saying that Venus or Swampert or Cat Shops shouldn't be allowed to talk about the abuse that they faced. I think that is perfectly fine. But considering we saw T do something similar, only to then be approached by whom I assume to be mutuals asking who the abuser was, I find it difficult to ignore that Venus or anyone else from the friend group might have also been approached by people asking who their abusers were. If they answered those questions, would they not be doing the very same thing T was so deplorable for doing? Venus would even make posts talking about how other people who were friends with Venus were friends with this abuser, and how some people reblogged this abuser's work and Venus would see it. Normally, this sort of open, kind of guilt-trippy public acknowledgement would prompt friends of Venus to ask who this abuser was, lest they be the person who committed this social offense or who otherwise might in the future. It's just, it's a lot. And it ultimately ends in a lot of people either having their present day opinions colored by past actions or just flat out being hypocrites. So what does this all lead up to? What is the main takeaway? Well, Kaimurama and Venus can actually help me with that too. In Kaimurama's final video, she said, Unless Salem decides to swallow their pride and become a better person. If they apologize to the people they hurt, if they stop stealing designs and selling them as adoptables, if they stop half-assing their commission work, if they start overall just improving as an artist, and once again, if Salem is watching this, I'm not apologizing to you. What you did really did hurt me. But I do think that you can become a better person. I do think that you have the potential to improve. And I'm encouraging that because I do want you to be a better person and have support as a, as a good artist, as a good person. But you need to change for that. This is not hate. I'm giving you criticism because I genuinely want to see you improve as a person. I want you to excel 
in your artwork and what you want to do like with your games and your story and I want you to do better. Kaimurama ends on the statement that she wants Tirza to be better. Similarly, on April 25th, 2016, Venus posted this, stipulating that the best apology is changed behavior, and specifically putting the at Tirza hashtag on the post so we know for sure it's directed at and talking about Tirza. Both of these posts talk about Tirza improving as a person, and after having gone through this situation, we know that T's main issues are the abusive and possessive behavior towards others that may be fueled by their mental health issues. In Tears' apology, they mentioned that they were in the process of getting therapy and improving on those issues, which I sincerely hope to be the case. However, if we believe Venus that Tirza doesn't know or refuses to acknowledge their abusive behavior and the end goal of these callouts is to then get them to address that behavior, how are they supposed to do that if 90% of what they're being accused of isn't actually true? No, I'm serious. Really think about it. If we believe that T doesn't know what the issues are and needed to be publicly called out on this behavior in order to correct it, then how are they supposed to differentiate between the offenses they actually committed versus those dreamt up by people who dislike them? We believe Venus and Swampert and Nagita and Catchops when they say they were on the receiving end of T's abuse. But the claim that T's art is borderline pedophilic or else problematic in that regard, the notion that T's artwork needs to be changed to cater to those who view it, the notion that they sexualize a character who passes for five tea-stealing characters, romanticizing abuse, creating bad LGBTQA plus or mental health representation? None of these are actually objective offenses that T has committed. It's mostly based on interpretations that others have gotten from their artwork. Kaimurama claimed that T drew self-harm and set up the criteria that people who self-harm don't share it neither of which is true. In fact, when you know a little more about T and their relationship to the characters that people are so upset about, it becomes really apparent that a lot of these claims are not grounded in fact. They're just things that people on a gossip forum believe, even if they haven't necessarily been given a reason to do so, and I guess with Kaimurama, things that they choose to believe regardless as to whether that belief is challenged or criticized. They're delusions, guys. If T, someone whom Kaimurama accepts likely suffers from schizoaffective disorder, has issues specifically revolving around their perception of reality and how they react to it, then how effective do you think a video is going to be if they demand changes on things that T hasn't even done? You're giving T all of these different issues for them to correct, which ultimately only draws their attention away from the actual issues they need to work on and focuses their attention on things that don't exist or aren't problems. If most of what's being thrown out against T are things that T is fully aware they haven't done, and one accusation happens to be the correct one, which do you think is more likely? Do you think it more likely that T would be able to pick out the false claims and recognize the abuse issues? Or would it be more likely for them to write off the accusations as a whole because the majority of them are complete bullshit? Or should we accept the notion that T should conform to some of these standards and must therein change their work to what others say it should be? Because that's a really bad slippery slope to get on, guys. What further compounds and frankly makes this whole situation become a huge counterintuitive problem is that so much of this is directed towards discrediting T's artwork, which not only isn't connected to their abusive behavior, a sentiment that Venus themselves actually shares, but also which happens to be where T makes their money from. You know, money. That thing that you need to pay for therapy and medication. Guys, since I started this video, Tirza's Patreon has been closed. Kaimurama's first video has her end off by saying that nobody should support T, and one of the accusations is that T half-asses their commissions or else scams people. An additional accusation claims that T's artwork is problematic. What do you think the end result of that is going to be? I'll tell ya, it's gonna be people distancing themselves from Tirza, specifically Tirza's audience base. That means T's not gonna have as many people interacting with their work, thus reducing engagement. Similarly, the claim that T half-asses their commission work means that people are likely going to commission them less, reducing T's income. The closing of their Patreon just amplifies this. So let me get this straight. The best apology is changed behavior, and you want to see T change and become a better person. Yet while claiming this, you put out videos that call into question the worth of their art and requesting that people not support them, which would then affect Tirza's finances, potentially leading to a loss of stability in their life. And that's assuming their home life is stable to begin with. And probably should note, if Tirza is keeping an eye on Venus's blog like Venus seems to believe, then that means this public callout is something that has been held over their head as a constant reference to past behavior, potentially leading to T spending more energy to subvert the beliefs of those who came across this claim and less into actually self-reflecting 
and working on themselves. That just seemed like something to bring up. Sometimes, if someone's being called out publicly for a long period of time and they're still denying the claims, they end up spending more time trying to fix their reputation, which, if you want that person to get better, ends up defeating or else impeding the point of this call out. In that case, question, what do you think happens when someone's home stability goes out the window? Do you think their mental health gets better? Do you think that discrediting Tears as income source is going to help them get the therapy and medication needed? How the actual fuck are you encouraging Tirza to be better? You're negatively affecting their income sources while demanding they seek help from places that would generally need you to have money. For full context, I don't know what Tears' medical policies are like, whether they have insurance, whether they're on a plan, or whether they pay for their prescriptions directly. I am merely making note that if any amount of Tears' earnings goes into paying for the treatment of their mental health conditions, then Kaimurama is setting up a situation that would make getting said treatment and medication more difficult, which might then exacerbate the symptoms and behaviors that are being cited as issues. So you want Tears to get better, but you're attacking the foundation upon which T might be able to do that. Great. Yeah, remember when I said that there might be an instance of people blaming someone with a mental health condition for exhibiting symptoms of that condition? Recurring thoughts and threats of self-harm are literally cited as one of the recognizable symptoms for people with borderline personality disorder. Yes, these are ultimately destructive, which is why they are considered part of a mental illness. And yes, this can lead to negative, toxic, manipulative, destructive relationships that nobody should be forced to deal with. But continuing to exhibit symptoms of a health condition that you have does does not mean that the person suffering is doing nothing about the issue. Honestly, just the fact that Venus expected these outbursts to end so soon after Tirza claimed to have been formally diagnosed and, at the time, recently attempting to get help should point out to you guys that this was slightly unreasonable. Oh, they apologized and say they're getting help now, so any more displays of this behavior must clearly be intentional and signs that the person actively doesn't want to change. No, that's not how that works. Guys, people don't tend to just be inherently evil. This is isn't Power Rangers. Frankly, it's kind of disgusting that someone with mental health issues who was going through an abusive relationship is being villainized for demonstrating the symptoms of their conditions. I'm not going to argue that Tirza was manipulative, because I think they were. They have admitted they were a garbage person in high school. But I am going to argue this notion that upon diagnosis, Tirza's symptoms not immediately going away means anything here other than T suffers from this condition. I do not want there to be a precedent where people can blame those for exhibiting symptoms of their mental health issues. Yes, you can criticize how they deal with them publicly, or their outward behavior and level of remorse for their actions, but you cannot villainize them for the symptoms continuing despite them claiming that they are trying to get help. Sometimes it doesn't immediately work. I want that to be very fucking clear. Criticizing T for posting their real-life self-harm online because it isn't a productive means of venting about or dealing with their emotions is a perfectly reasonable thing to address. But you'll notice that in all of what I've talked about here, that hasn't been said, because that's not what's being argued. Instead, both T's behavior and art is being framed as intentionally malicious because in both instances, Tears' conditions are relatively prominent. Instead, the artwork that T uses as a means of dealing with trauma and mental illness and expressing themselves is being touted as toxic, dangerous, and harmful. But like, did you guys just forget about art therapy? You know that drawing pictures to vent about or express your emotions is supposed to be a good thing, right? Creating art to let out emotions is supposed to be healthy. Some therapists even recommend it. And yet here, an artist is being shamed for drawing pieces based on their mental illness. Two different times from this situation, noticeable signs from T's mental illness has been used to portray them in a negative light. And, as we've seen, not always in places where they were objectively in the wrong. In Nuke's post, T was even subtly blamed for someone else's condition. T demonstrates symptoms of BPD and it's their fault because you have to take responsibility for your mental illness. But Nuke demonstrates symptoms of their schizophrenia and it's somehow also Tirza's fault? Yes, Tirza should apologize for these threatening not alive outbursts to the person they did it to, cat shops. In this specific situation, I don't think Venus is owed an apology. T didn't contact Venus themselves. Venus was pulled into the situation by cat shops. I don't know how things went down in their friendship. I'm not gonna pretend like I do. I'm not gonna say anyone needs to make up and be friends here. You're all allowed to hate each other. But I do firmly believe that this second apology for Tears' not life threat after the in-person talking formal apology is not something that Venus is actually owed. An apology for directed harassment, sure, but not for Tears' continuing 
continuing to exhibit behavioral symptoms from their condition and Venus being roped into it by the person Tirza seemed to be directing this towards. Cat shops and anybody else they directly messaged with these not alive threats would be owed that apology. Nobody else. Not Chimerama and not the internet. I hope I'm getting across exactly why this doesn't work. It makes zero sense for people to demand that someone do better, but then remove or else deplete the resources needed to do so. There are already a lot of systems in place in politics that prove that this is not how things work. It makes even less sense to say that someone needs to do better themselves while you're throwing out a bunch of accusations that aren't even true. How are they supposed to do better themselves if some of these aren't even issues? How is Tirza supposed to fix something they weren't even doing? Your baseline for how bad Tirza is and therein how much they need to improve already starts from a place of ignorance and misunderstanding. This entire thing was garbage. Whether it be the demand that T change their artwork because others don't like it, whether it be discouraging people to support T's work, whether it be claiming that someone suffering from schizoaffective disorder creating a character based on themselves who also suffers from schizoaffective disorder is bad representation, whether it be condemning the themes explored in T's art, or whether whether it be using a fucking gossip forum as a resource, nothing was done right here. If T traces something, sure, call them out for it. They almost entirely lift someone else's character design, point it out. They give someone a finished commission that wasn't what the buyer asked for, bring attention to it. But if it's something you can't prove or something you heard from someone else and don't actually have any experience in, maybe leave it on the cutting room floor. Outside of the actions that T has taken against ex-friends and other artists, these videos failed to reveal anything actively nefarious that T was doing, especially with regards to their art, and seems to ignore any instances where T's accusers have committed the same social offenses. Venus condemned T for vague posting about their ex-friends, but Venus was also vague posting about T. Kaimurama tried to vilify T for being inspired by her character, but Kaimurama was also inspired by T's character. Speaking of which, how do you like the art? I hope it's been fun to watch. B spent a stupid amount of time on these. Thought you guys might appreciate a little, uh, character design in the background. You like them? Here, 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 look. We got Aspen, Baker, Astrid, Matcha, Kieran, Coco Lime, Clear Jade, Yoko, and arguably my favorite, Blanche. Isn't art fun? Oh, although, now knowing that Venus knew T in real life and had been over to T's house, if we assume the note about animal abuse came from Venus, as Venus has created posts talking about it, then that gives a little extra to that claim. You see, Kaimurama, with just a little more effort to put into your research, we were able to give some more weight to the one accusation in the video that you were worried about. Too bad the rest of your videos completely sucked. If you wanted to help T recognize the issues they actually had, then guess what would have been more effective? Making a video talking about your interactions and personal experiences with T. You can't argue feelings. Feelings are valid. If Kaimurama or Venus felt that they were hurt by T, nobody gets to tell them that they're not allowed to feel hurt. If a bunch of artists had made videos talking about their bad interactions with T, those examples would be grounded in actual truth, and T might be able to watch the videos and get an understanding of how their specific actions make other people feel and therein what they need to work on. But instead, now we have a slew of videos spouting absolute horse malarkey and driving a stake into the heart of T's income. That's not how you help people get better! Oh, plus, you know, I ended up going over to T's YouTube and watching a few vids that had been posted before Kaimuramas. I also at the time was trying to make money any way I could because I have no other income. I restrict out of fear or I binge to make myself feel better. Regardless, I end up feeling pretty bad about it in the end, which is exactly why I uh, am medicated for this issue. This issue has been quite severe for me. In the past, it has led up to something as bad as cutting, self-harm, and I don't want that to continue. So because of this, I stay medicated. I request medication from my doctors, I explain to them the situation, they understand, I emphasize how serious it is for me, I emphasize just how much damage it is doing to me, and with that, they just have no choice but to see where I'm coming from, basically. So, 
For people who have a similar issue to myself, who have no impulse control for whatever reason, personally, I experience borderline personality disorder, which may also be the cause of my binging habits because I have very poor impulse control. I would suggest you seek someone out, be it a therapist, someone who can tell you what behaviors you need to adjust and how to adjust them, or seek a psychiatrist who can prescribe you medication that can help you maintain healthy eating habits. Bailey essentially is a nasty, nasty character. He's a very bad person. He gives off the vibe of one of those soft boys, a soft boy, um, a deceitful young man he is. He acts very pleasant, but his main role in the story is as an antagonist. Bailey has stalker tendencies. He doesn't just have stalker tendencies, he is a full-blown stalker to a very, very terrifying extent, to the point where with his ex-girlfriend Valentine, he would leave dead animals at her house. He would watch her daily, send her messages, notes, letters, saying what she had done that day and how he would hurt her. So, taking that into account, you will know that Bailey is a bad person as a character. From ages 9 years old to 19 years old, I had identified as an aromantic asexual. Basically, asexual, no additions. Nothing to add to it, I just was not attracted to anyone, there was nothing else to specify. I was actually rather repulsed by the concept of romance. This is probably due to parts of my upbringing and things that have happened in my past with other people. I was never very good with my relationships with other people because I've always had discomfort with intimacy. We both happen to suffer from a habit of self-harm. We have since agreed to one another to support and encourage the stopping of this. We agree that we're going to stop together. We are going to improve together. How do you come up with OC ideas? The same would basically apply to this, only I'm not getting it from photos of people and such. I will occasionally get ideas from photos. Maybe I get an idea for one small thing I saw in a photo, which is maybe combination horns and feathered wings, which I did before. And I honestly get ideas from many little things, be it a photo, a character I saw on a show, or a book. I don't take the same ideas, but instead take inspiration from those ideas and turn them into my own thing that is maybe comparable to the first thing, but not in a way that makes you think it's the same thing. Rather, you would think, wow, this took influence from that. In my phone, I use an iPhone, so there's an app called Notes. And in this app, I have a note, which is just a list of ideas for my art and my characters. And this is honestly how I go about creating most of my recent characters. So, I write down anything that inspires me, I save anything that inspires me, be it a photo, a piece of writing, I write something down, I save the photo, and I just keep it in mind for the future for when I'm ready to use it. This applies to every aspect of character creation for me. When I'm finally ready, I combine all of those traits. And during this time, there was a pretty big amount of people who would draw in my art style or an art style heavily influenced by mine, enough to the point to where it would attract other people with less than positive intentions. Said people would harass, insult, and generally 
be mean to the people who were drawing things that were influenced by my own art. And I felt stronger things about it back in 2016 than I do now. What I'm talking about there is that it bothered me more than people copying my art or tracing my art. And it has only bothered me less and less as time has gone by. This is because I know in almost every case they're not profiting off of it and they're not doing it in spite of me. They're not doing it because they hate me. It's often because they like my art and they want their art to look like it, which I don't mind. So when I was 14, I finally had a group of friends who were actually involved with art. We basically all drew and during that time, I had still been pretty damn confident in myself. I thought my art was pretty good. I happened to think my art was better than theirs because I was 14. I was kind of a douchebag. And when I say kind of, I mean, I was a pretty big douchebag. I now know, especially when it comes to friends, I don't want to be comparing my art with other people's art. It's going to make me feel bad. It's going to make someone else feel bad. But at this point, I wasn't aware of that. I had just been focused on myself and my own art and feeling good about it with no regard to how it makes other people feel. The final inspiration I will mention for this video would be the artists you find me following on social media. All of these artists happen to give me inspiration either in small ways or big ways. And in the end, I follow them for a reason. Whether it be my own friends, my friends have always influenced me and my ideas and my art. 2015, I guess I was influenced by my friends at the time. My art became much more provocative and sexual. And it was meant more to attract a mature audience, which I have since strayed from. Not completely, but I don't draw, like, not safe for work stuff anymore. I don't draw crotch bulges anymore. That kind of repulses me. So, in 2015, my art had become much more provocative. It had started focusing on pastel goth themes. It had become much pinker. I had a much larger focus on the color pink and the color black and the color white. And with all of those, I created the aesthetic that I use in my art now. So what I started then is what I keep up today with my art. Now I'm not saying I created this aesthetic, I'm saying I started drawing with this aesthetic and it stuck it stuck with me might not look like it but i promise you guys i'm screaming actually quick observation about that this recounting from tirza coincides with some of the accusations from the tumblr callout thread claiming that tirza incorporated aspects of their friends art into their own please be aware however that these stolen attributes are things like a sweater an eye patch height and red eyeliner none of which are things these artists have any actual claim of ownership for. But, incidentally, just like Kaimurama, they also allude to taking inspiration from a character being inappropriate based on how personal to the artist that character is. Which, guys, firstly, you can't just assume that everyone knows that a character is so personal to you that they're not allowed to be inspired by it, nor the attributes from other places that you use to create it and do not own. And secondly, if these characters are so personal that you can't accept the notion of someone else taking inspiration from them, then you shouldn't be posting them online. By default, as your audience grows, you're going to have more people looking at your work and being either consciously or subconsciously influenced by it. There is no getting around that. 
If you can't handle them doing that, something that most budding artists do and which is not illegal, then don't put your artwork out there in the first place. In fact, this artist wasn't even complaining about Ash incorporating an attribute into their character, they were just complaining about Ash drawing the character with an eye patch. You'll note how the eye patch is not a part of Ash's actual design, they just drew them with one at some point. So it's even dumber. Also of note, Nagita says they became friends with Tirza at the age of 11 or 12. They're three years younger than everyone, which would have made Tirza either 14 or 15. So, again, this is behavior that is almost a decade old at this point. Look, if Tirza was going around trying to ruin people, I'd have a problem with them too, okay? But Kaimurama's video was released in October of 2019. Like, even if you believed what Kiwi Farms had to say on a slew of these issues, you still didn't take the time to see if Tears' behavior had changed or if they had at least made an effort. And now that I've got a better grasp on all of this, I'm starting to suspect that what you called T out for on Instagram was all of this bullshit and the Kira thing. Basically all of which you were wrong on. So if that had been the case, Guess who was the villain, Kaimurama? I'm not gonna say that Venus needs to forgive Tirza or talk to them or even acknowledge them beyond this point, but I am going to point out that it's stupid to have an entire Before You Follow page dedicated to expanding on your distrust of Tirza, highlighting and reblogging posts which would only be taken down under the provision that T apologize and improve, while also wanting nothing to do with them and not wanting them to approach you, and then be shocked when people bring this up or else be convinced that the only way people could come to you about this is if they had been sent there by tears of themselves. It's almost like you're putting a big I have issue with tears of sticker on your forehead, but then being mad when people draw attention to or ask about it. That's actively dumb. Almost all of what you tried to get tea for was flat out not true, and the other half was the lot of you being hypocritical Heathers. Even Kaimurama's whole, oh, but they romanticize abuse thing, was her being a hypocrite because Kaimurama is a fangirl of one of the pillar men from JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. So Meg romanticizes a murderous JoJo character who not only committed genocide, but also experimented on humans for his own personal gain. Why is it okay to create romantic scenarios with a murderer, but the romanticizing of the after effects of abuse is not allowed. Oh, but T draws it. Kaimurama just likes the character. Yes, but Kaimurama idolizes the character, and we can see canonically within the show that he murders people and committed genocide. So Kaimurama is romanticizing abuse and murder that someone else is drawing. They're romanticizing an abuser and murderer, but it's bad for T to, according to Kaimurama's logic, romanticize abuse that they draw themselves. Oh, but they're not romanticizing the murder, just the character. They don't draw the murder. Don't even test me. The complaint against T is that they romanticize abusive relationships despite that abuse not being drawn and for the most part being hinted at only in the character bios and through bruises. The abuse isn't drawn but it happens behind the scenes and is a part of the character dynamics. If the context behind the characters and the pieces must be acknowledged and that determines whether it's okay or not then Kaimurama sexualizing a genocidal maniac means that she's romanticizing genocide and that's bad. This works both ways honey. Kaimurama wants to fuck the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure World equivalent of a Neolithic Hitler, but T is not allowed to make up an abusive twink to obsess creepily over and beat up their made-up self-insert. Mind you, I haven't even delved into how unabashedly absurd it is that a bunch of artists are demanding that someone censor their art. I'll let B rage about that one instead. Everyone has fucked up here to some degree. While I agree with Kaimurama and Venus that T should accept their faults in order to move on from them as a better person, I completely disagree with their methods. Within them, they've demonstrated blatant hypocrisy and double standards, they've created contradictory conditions for Tirza to conform to, and they spread a bunch of accusations that were flat out wrong. Like, that's already confusing and a no-win scenario for someone without perception-altering health conditions. There's been so much talk about how Tirza just ignores the criticism and refuses to change for the better, a lot of that having to do with their artwork, yet we've seen firsthand that Kaimurama has also rejected criticism and run from the consequences of her actions when called out. If you legitimately want a person to be better and do better, you wouldn't simultaneously be trying to destroy them. People don't just magically become martyrs or saints and better people now that everybody hates them and they have no income. You want T to do better, Kaimurama? When you you're allowed to just pick up and run when you fucked up and spread misinformation about someone? If you can't be bothered to practice what you preach, then why should anyone else be bothered to? Be the role model. Act the way you're saying others should act. Take responsibility for your fuck-ups. Do better. Be better. 
And good God, get some better resources, sheesh! <sighs> Are you guys sick of this crud? I'm sick of this crud. Do you want to see some cute fan art? I want to see some cute fan art. Let's take an inquisitive gander at Phoenix Sprocket by M6RS. Well, pardon me, but I must disagree. I'm enjoying this blue shape fade behind her. It's like she's shimmying forward to tell you you're an idiot. Nee, 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 you're wrong. Holding off on some fun, here's Hold My Tentacles Part 1 and 2 by Wardist 100, wherein Ponder Sprocket's greatest secret is revealed. Dun dun dun. I hope it's Wardist and not W Artist. Hold my tentacles. Wait, what? It's okay, Common. I don't think everyone just expects them to come off like that. Sliding into frame is Junkie and Ponder by Aaron Kassarian. Nice rhyming there. Because if that poor dragon boy didn't already have a reason to worry, that smile and those shadows seem poised to change that. She'll probably crush him in a bear hug or something. Answering the call of the squid signal, it's fan art for Octomama by Jureka Katie, taking on a more traditionally superhero-centered interpretation for all of us to enjoy. There are the tentacles in the darkness, the glowing eyes in the shadows, the cityscape surveyor, the... Uh, uh, cephalopodic savior? I don't know. Decked out to dance, here's Crossover Crowd High Ponder Fan Art by XX Demon Peach XX, making reference to a show I wasn't even aware of called Crowd High. Ponder Sprocket's not the danciest of my characters, but I loved seeing an idea of what she would look like if she were ready to break down. Roaring in from the shadows, it's Monster Ponder by Guts on Discord, turning her into a spooky, spirally shadow cloak clad creature with horns and a forked tongue, giving me Medusa type vibes. I feel like she's waiting for me as the main boss in a dungeon. Revved up and Ready to go, here's Cybertronian Ponder Sprocket by Lumen Animation, where it looks like Ponder Sprocket's gotten a major upgrade. The tentacles are bigger, the muscles are metal, and she'll probably transform and roll out all over somebody. Beep boop. Why'd you say beep boop? I don't know. Can you make transformer noises with your mouth? Because I sure can't. <coughs> To bless us with some chibi cuteness, we have fan art, oh my, why do they never learn, by Detective Conan Lover 3. Fiend, bring out the evidence. Oh boy, here we go again. And the good boy's tentacles are flailing around, grabbing videos and files galore. He's posed at the ready for whatever the Octomama might need. Such a helpful little techno push. Presenting a cute original style TM do not steal, here's Ponder is Allergic to Stupidity Gift by Extreme Absols 99 I'm allergic to stupidity. I break out in sarcasm. This shirt is perfect for Ponder Sprocket, and nobody can tell me otherwise. She's a sass master. That grin only further makes it evident. No matter how nice and clean her hair is drawn, it's a trap. Sparkling in the low light, here's Precious Octo Queen by Artie Demon, dressing Ponder Sprocket up in something formal, form fitting, and freaking phenomenal. The gorgeous shine of her dress, the lovely hairstyle, her partner passively playing possum until needed, a fittingly fashionable piece to adore. My god, the alliteration, I can't stop. For more chibi fun, we have Ponder Chibi and her octopus fan art by Gage Hopeful, where Fiend has turned into a big, strong tectopus. Oh, goodness. Oh, but he's the perfect size for a sleepy little chibi ponder to snuggle on. The shimmer of highlights all across the characters contrasts so nicely with the starry background. It's just lovely. And finally, we'll pop in a little Ponder Sprocket by Miss CPD on Discord to enjoy. I quite like how Fiend's thick tentacles and Ponder Sprocket herself really fill out the whole canvas here. Even her hair poofs out and demands more space and attention. It's a charming little aspect that works well with this cute art style. Much love. If you like any of these pieces, please don't hesitate to give the artist some love through the links that I have provided down in the description. A big thanks to all of my editors, there are links in the description for you guys to enjoy. My links are also down there if you're so inclined. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive. I'm B, a bunch of tentacles masquerading itself as an artist. You've been watching Ponder Sprocket, and with that, Octomama out.